Yes, there we go. All right. Let's get started. Tuesday, April 16th, 2024, regular meeting of the City Council. I am calling this meeting to order. Notice is hereby given to the members of the City Council and to the general public that at this regular meeting, the City Council may vote to go into executive session, which will not be open to the public, for discussion and consultation with the City's attorneys for legal advice on any item listed on the following agenda. Can we have roll call? Mayor Daggett? Here. Vice Mayor Aslan? Present. Councilmember Harris? Here. Councilmember House? Here. Councilmember Matthews? Here. Councilmember McCarthy? Here. Councilmember Sweet? Here. Thank you. Councilmember House, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? It would be my honor. Thank you, Mayor. Please stand if you're able. Councilmember Harris, our mission statement. The mission of the city of Flagstaff um, is to protect and enhance the quality of life for all. Thank you. And Councilmember McCarthy, our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Mayor. The Flagstaff City Council humbly acknowledges the ancestral homelands of this area's indigenous nations and original stewards. These lands, still inhabited by native descendants, border mountains sacred to indigenous peoples. We honor them, their legacies, their traditions, and their continued contributions. We celebrate their past, present, and future generations who will forever know this place as home. Thank you. All right, moving down to the open call to the public. This enables the public to address the council about an item that is not on the prepared agenda. Comments related to items that are on the agenda will be taken at the time that that item is discussed. You have three minutes to address us and during open call to the public, the council cannot respond. We have comment cards, all right, and um, we also limit public comment during this open call to the public to 30 minutes, but we have open call to the public again at the end of the meeting, and that time is uh, unlimited. So, open call to the public. Dennis Givens. All right. Thanks a lot, City Council, Mayor Daggett, City Council, City Staff, the citizens, welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm here to, my name's Dennis Givens of the South Side. I'm here to, today to talk about heroes. My heroes are not musicians, movie stars, and athletes such as Justin Bieber, Brad Pitt, and Tom Brady. My heroes are all of you, the public servants, you on the City Council, the City Staff, especially those dudes in the back. And I just wanted to read a quote from one of my heroes, Robert F. Kennedy Sr. It's a part of his eulogy following the 1968 assassination of civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. It goes, what we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion towards one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country wherever they be white or wherever they be black or whatever they may be. And that's the quote I wanted to read today. It really touches me. And another thing, people keep saying, trust the science. Trust the science that Jesus is coming back. Trust the science that carbon is going to kill us all. Trust the science that Big Pharma knows best. But what about trusting the science of eating well and exercising? Diabetes, heart disease, and other ailments plague our society. I'm ready to reverse this trend together. Martha Luther King said, we must keep moving. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. Let's move. Thank you. Stephen Thompson. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. My name is Stephen Thompson, and I serve as a supervisor within the Sustainability Division 
And I'm just here uh, this afternoon to invite you all, as well as any members of the public who are here in person or online, to the Earth Day celebration happening on Saturday, April 20th, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Bushmaster Park. We have over 50 organizations who will be tabling at the event, promoting sustainability, conservation, and care for our shared spaces. Uh, there will be live music, food trucks, volunteer opportunities, and for the first time, we are offering a bike valet, so if anyone wants to pedal their way to Bushmaster Park, you can store your pedaled device in our bike valet. So that is all, and if you want more information, you are welcome to visit our webpage just by typing into a search engine, City of Flagstaff Earth Day Celebration, or sending me an email at stephen.thompson at flagstaffaz.gov. Thank you, and hope to see all of you there. Thank you. William Bedlow? Bedlin. My apologies. Good afternoon, City Council. I come to you as a business owner. My address is 4183 East Huntington Drive. I come here today to ask you guys for some help. The homeless factor over there is disgusting. The camping in the city street, the garbage vehicles, the defecation in my driveway that I have to put up with every day from cleaning up human feces from these people, the allowed to be drunk and disorderly and drinking in the streets all day long and then be allowed to be let into that shelter. I've had on many occasions, I've called the city of Flagstaff Police Department they tell me there's nothing that they can do about it, but yet there's a camping law inside of the city of Flagstaff, but it was cold and now we don't want them moved. I'm just asking you guys for help. I've drove streets in Mexico that are cleaner than my street that I have my business on. I have help that come in and out of my office at night that are afraid to even show up to my office in the middle of the night because of the drunks, because of the people harassing my office help that are there. It is an ongoing problem. I've owned this building for five years now. I have been there. I have called the city police department. I have done everything that I can do. And it is disgusting. It needs to be cleaned up. Somebody has to do something about it. And I have tried and tried and tried. And I can't, I just, I don't understand. I pay my taxes. I do all my stuff. I run a business. We do a lot of work for the city of Flagstaff, you know, and it's, it's disgusting. I even have the cops show up and the cops tell me that this is the worst place in town that they've seen, that it's nothing, there's nowhere else that looks like this. I encourage you one day to get in your car and drive down that road and tell me what it looks like. It is campers and just one guy full on pulls a camp trailer all the way apart, rebuilds it with pallets and puts tarps over it. It's been there for a year in the same spot. Junk cars, there's a pallet business right beside me he can't even do his business because he cannot get in and out of his gates because of all the junk that is parked in the middle of the road. The street's dangerous. There's vehicles parked where they're not supposed to be parked. Like you can barely get in and out of your driveways when these people show up with their motor homes and they live in them for months on end there and nothing's done about it. I just come to you guys today to ask you to help me clean this up. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving down to council liaison reports. Uh, let's start with council member Matthews. I don't have anything at this time. Thank you, Mayor. Council member Harris. I attended the Parks and Recs um, Commission meeting uh, yesterday and um, just got a lot of good information. I met our park ranger. Um, he, it happens to be a he, he works uh, Friday through Tuesday, I believe the days from 1030 to 7. He talked about the um, what he's doing in the parks and basically what he's doing in the parks is just making sure that people understand the rules and the policies of the park, uh, de-escalating situations before we have to call in law enforcement. And he was saying that that was, um, that he sees a lot of value in his role and in that position. Um, and the update on the Ponderosa Park uh, sports courts, everything is moving along and they should be starting construction shortly. Uh, we're probably get a lot of 
uh, calls from the public regarding some of the construction in that area. And everyone's just going to have to be a little patient uh, because we need to get these projects done and there's no other way to do it. So thank you. That's all for me. Thank you. Vice Mayor? I don't have anything. Councilmember McCarthy? Nothing today. Thank you. Councilmember Sweet? Thank you, Mayor. I attended the BPAC meeting and a little update. There are seven new beautification and action grants that are in process of review by BPAC with approval decisions happening in May. There are two murals, three utility cabinets, a labyrinth in Sunnyside, and a historical brick project in La Plaza Vieja. Super exciting, I love those meetings. Wednesday, there is a Mountain Line board meeting at 10 a.m. Thursday, there's the Water Commission here in the chambers at four, and Friday, there is a NAMWA meeting down in Chino Valley. I'll be out of town, so I'll be attending virtually on those. Thank you. Councilmember House. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the Housing Commission meeting for April was uh, canceled. They don't have a, an agenda for this month, um, so we will reconvene next month. Um, I was able to attend the Flagstaff Sister Cities meeting with the mayor um, and have some great conversations with them about some potential programs coming up there. Um, and this past Friday, I was able to, on behalf of the mayor and uh, the city council, attend the Teen Challenge Arizona banquet. Um, that was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, if anybody has an opportunity to get to that event, I 100% guarantee it. It was one of the most inspirational things that I have gotten to in a while. Um, to hear those uh, participants and graduate stories of successful recovery and uh, turning their lives around, um, reconnecting with family, uh, finding employment, and, and all of the things that came from that recovery journey. Um, it was just a really wonderful night and uh, also very successful. I believe they exceeded their fundraising goal um, within the couple of hours of that evening and still had at least one more uh, banquet in the state um, coming up. So it was really, really amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing from me. I will move down to item number six, appointments. This is an appointment to the Open Space Commission and uh, Vice Mayor is making this appointment. Madam Mayor, I would like to nominate uh, Chalita Borbin Runbeck for the position. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you to all the applicants. And that was for a term expiring April 2027. All right, moving down to consent agenda. Consent agenda items are considered by the city council to be routine unless a member of the city council expresses a desire at this meeting to remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion. The consent agenda will be enacted by one motion approving the recommendations. Unless otherwise indicated, expenditures approved by council are budgeted items. So under the consent agenda, we have A, B, C, and D. Are there, um, is there anything that anyone on the council would like to pull for discussion? Okay, then I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Mayor, I'll move to approve consent agenda items A through D as presented. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, moving down to routine items. Item number 8A, consideration and adoption of ordinance number 2024-09. And tonight we are to read the ordinance by title for the final time and then adopt the ordinance. We had presentations previously, and I will entertain a motion um, to read unless anyone has any questions or comments. Councilmember Matthews. Mayor, I'd like to move to read ordinance number 2024-09 by title only for the final time. I'll second. 
Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? City Clerk? An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff amending the Flagstaff City Code Chapter 1-14 Personnel System by amending the Employee Handbook of Regulations Section 1-70-020 Employee Wellness and 1-50-039 Purchase Day Program providing for repeal of conflicting ordinances, severability, authority for clerical corrections, and establishing an effective date. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adopt? So move. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Ordinance adopted. On to B, consideration and adoption of ordinance number 2024-11. This is regarding um, the employee personnel system, and we also had a presentation about this. So unless any council members have questions or comments, I will entertain a motion to read the ordinance by title only for the final time. Mayor, I move to read ordinance number 2024-11 by title only for the final time. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? City Clerk? An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff, Arizona, amending the Flagstaff City Code Chapter 1-14 Personnel System, Section 1-14-001-0006, Employee Advisory Committee, Subsection 1-14-001-0006.1, Definitions, and the Employee Handbook of Regulations, Section 1-10-070, Employee Advisory Committee, providing for repeal of conflicting ordinances, severability, authority for clerical corrections, and establishing an effective date. Can I get a motion to adopt? I move to adopt ordinance number 2024-11. Can I get a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, moving down to C, consideration and adoption of ordinance number 2024-12 regarding um, speed limits. And this is also one that we've had discussion and presentation on previously. So we are here to read the ordinance by title only for the final time. Can I get a motion? Here. I'll move to read ordinance number 2024-12 by title only for the final time. And a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, City Clerk. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff amending the Flagstaff City Code Title IX Traffic, Chapter 9-01 Traffic Code, Section 9-01-001-0002, Specific Speed Limits, providing for penalties, repeal of conflicting ordinances, severability, and establishing an effective date. And can I get a motion to adopt? Mayor, I'll move to adopt ordinance number 2024-12. Thank you. And a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Moving right along on down to D, consideration and adoption of resolution number 2024-15 and ordinance number 2024-13. This is regarding amendments to Flagstaff City Code, engineering design, and standards and specifications. This too has been discussed and we had a presentation. So can I get, unless anyone has any questions or comments, can I get a motion to adopt resolution number 2024-15? Mayor, I move to adopt resolution number 2024-15. Thank you. Can I get a second? I'll second. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. And can I get a motion to read ordinance number 2024-13 by title only for the final time? So moved. Can I get a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And 
Any opposed? City Clerk? An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff amending the Flagstaff City Code Title 13 Engineering Design Standards and Specifications for New Infrastructure by adopting by reference that certain document entitled 2024 Amendments to Flagstaff City Code Title 13 Engineering Design Standards and Specifications for New Infrastructure providing for repeal of conflicting ordinances, severability, and establishing an effective date. Can I get a motion to adopt? So moved. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, moving down to our regular agenda, item number 9A, consideration and adoption of resolution number 2024-18. We haven't seen you for a couple of meetings. That's usually a good thing, right? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Bryce Doty, I'm the real estate manager. Today I have two parcels um, that for which we have been unable to successfully um, come to a conclusion to acquire land. And these are two parcels needed for the Lone Tree acquisition. I just have a quick map I want to show you um, to run through these, but this resolution authorizes filing condemnation actions on these. Um, our current project schedule, um, we're just out of time on these, so we're trying to get the right to work on these lands um, in time for the project schedule. Um, we may still settle these with them outside of any condemnation actions, but we're trying to move forward so that we have them uh, for the project timeline. Here's where we are in the Lone Tree overpass world. Um, we're at the intersection of Lone Tree and Butler. These two stars are where these two parcels are. The first one is owned by SV Dirtworks. We need 458 square feet of right-of-way. Um, on this map right here, we're talking about this area that I'm pointing to here, my next slide will kind of hone in on that. We also need 1,000 square feet of TCE, or temporary construction easement on it. So this is where we are. We just need this little corner cut where we're gonna be putting in the new sidewalk there. Um, we've made our offers. We've kind of followed all, the, um, all of the requirements. Um, we did entertain some possibilities of potentially trading any excess land um, right away, so that might be coming back you know, later on. Um, because there is some adjacent to his, but we just couldn't make any of the unit valuations and counters work. So we're proceeding, um, asking for this resolution tonight so that we have the authority to, to condemn. And the next parcel is owned by Campus Crest. This is actually, it's uh, basically the common area of the, uh, the apartment complex over here. We need about 1,969 square feet of right of way, and then we need 2,200 and 13 square feet of uh, temporary construction easements. And it really is just here on the edge here, um, basically putting in new sidewalk. Um, and so the right of way line is gonna be that new blue line and we need TCE to install that new sidewalk there. Um, again, uh, we've made offers, followed all the, the steps on this. We've just been unable to really close these transactions. So that's what this resolution is about today. Um, that's everything I got. If you have any questions, let me know. Council, any questions? Can I get a motion to read the ordinance? Mayor, I move that we read ordinance 2024-18 by title only. Is We're looking at, oh yes, you are correct. Yep, that's the one we're looking at. Um, can I get a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? City Clerk? A resolution of the Flagstaff City Council authorizing condemnation of real property for the Lone Tree Overpass Project, providing for delegation of authority and establishing an effective date. Thank you. I move to adopt resolution 2024-18. Thank you. Do, can I get a second? Aye. I'll second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. And all right, uh, item B, consideration and adoption of ordinance number 2024-14. 
Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Vice President, and Council, Vice Mayor <clears throat> and Council Members. I'm Carmen Pryor, the Real Estate Specialist with the City of Flagstaff, and I'm presenting an ordinance for the ratification of the easements for this year. And I was just here a few months ago, but we were a little bit late on last year's, and that's why that happened. And so this will be done annually in April each year. Um, so I am asking for your consideration to approve ordinance 2024-14 um, for the transfer of the easements and real property interest to the city of Flagstaff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council, any questions or comments? I will entertain a motion to read the ordinance. Mayor, I'll move to read ordinance number 2024-14 by title only for the first time. Can I get a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? All right, City Clerk. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff ratifying the grant and reservation of easements and formally accepting dedications and donations of easements and real property interests, providing for severability, authority for clerical corrections, and establishing an effective date. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving down to C. Consideration and approval of cooperative agreement between the City of Flagstaff and Flagstaff Metropolitan Planning Organization. Do we have a presentation? Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, <laughs> Vice Mayor, and City Council. Coming you from the big screen. Um, this item before you today, item 9C, is a cooperative agreement with our, one of our great partners, the Flagstaff Metropolitan Planning Organization. Uh, this is to assist them and help them with a cash advance fund. Uh, as we know as a city, when you have funds which, with high grants, there takes time to get reimbursements back from the state or federal government. And so we're just trying to assist the FMPO in managing their cash balances. Uh, with a cash advance fund that will be invested uh, on our behalf and allow them for timely payments while they're waiting for reimbursements. Um, so this is a cooperative agreement we're looking for your approval for. Council, do you have any questions? Councilmember McCarthy. I'll just note that the uh, FMPO, otherwise known as Metroplan, approved this uh, uh, recently. Oh. Wait a minute. Randa, am I correct, or is that just on the upcoming agenda? That was at the last meeting. Okay, so I am correct. Thank you. Approved asking for this or entering into this agreement. All right. Um, can I get a motion to... Wait a minute. Appro can I get a motion to approve the cooperative agreement? Mayor, I move to approve the cooperative, cooperative agreement between the City of Flagstaff and Flagstaff Metropolitan Planning Organization for the purposes of a cash advance fund. All right, can I get a second? I second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you, Rick. Item D, consideration and adoption of resolution number 2024-19. This is adopting a notice of intention to increase water, sewer, and reclaimed water rates or rate components, fees, or service charges. All right. So is there, um, we discussed this, right, at our retreat. Go ahead. So just for the public, um, this resolution just says that we're considering this and that we'll likely do it but it does not include any specifics on how much it'll be or anything like that. This is just, a, there'll be public uh, information given out to the public and council will uh, talk about this again before we actually do anything. And Madam Mayor, if, if I may, it, it is a legal requirement a certain amount of time before you do that. So it's, it's just a formality more than anything else for that very purpose. Thank you, council member. Well, I, I totally agree. So does that mean that you will uh, move to read resolution number 2024-19 by title only? I uh, so what? move. And I'm, I'm wondering if Aaron has anything to say. Oh. Okay. Okay. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Aaron Young, Water Resources Manager. I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull up our presentation and I wasn't paying attention to the question. It was pretty straightforward. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> we have a lot to say. Uh, we have a, a pretty lengthy presentation. Uh, the six, seven, eight months we've been at this, we're pulling it all together tonight to, to present a rates package um, and adopt or consider adoption of the notice of intent. And with that, I'll introduce uh, Carol Molesky with Santec, and I'll pull up her presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of Council. I'm back. And this time, you're going to see the whole picture tonight. First of all, I just wanted to reiterate why we are here today, why I am here to give you some all of the information all at once. But we are asking the City Council to adopt that notice of intent to increase rates or rate components, fees, and service charges. While I'm going to be showing you a lot of what you've seen before, there are some new components. So I'd like to um, walk through the agenda. We're going to talk back all the way back from when we started this rate study and discuss the financial plans. That was last fall. I'm going to talk about capacity fees again. We'll go over the miscellaneous fees that you have not seen yet. And then we'll talk about cost of service rates. Then we'll go back to that resolution and next steps. We've been talking about the pieces for all of these months of this rate study that we started nearly 10 months ago. And I'd like to show you this graphic that pulls it all together in terms of water services, rates, fees, and charges that helps operate the water fund, rec the reclaimed water fund, and the wastewater fund. So these fees and charges comprise monthly user charges, that's about 84% of your total revenues, and these are the primary sources of funding for your operations and maintenance and capital improvements. That includes the base fee and usage fees that encourage conservation. These are the rate structures that we've been talking about. We must keep up with the cost of inflation and other pressures to maintain good service to customers, so that's why we are coming back through to this rate study. These fees also ensure adequate fire protection, and these fees can be reduced by external funding sources, so loans, grants, et cetera. The next component of the fees are the what we call miscellaneous fees, and those comprise about 7% of your total revenues for the utilities. These include permit fees, meter fees, late fees, et cetera, and hauled waste fees. And so far, I haven't talked to you about them, but I will tonight. Then we have the capacity fees. We spent some time talking about capacity fees. These make up 6% of your annual revenues on average, and they only apply to those new meters or new connections or increases in size or capacity of a connection. These help defray the cost associated with growth. And they also, again, reduce the impacts to ratepayers so that we are not subsidizing new customers um, with, through rates. In total, all of these sources comprise the revenues that fund the water services needs. And actually, I skipped the non-rate revenues. Non-rate revenues are things like um, your uh, income earnings from interest and other types of fees that are just 3% of the revenues. Those are external to this study, so we won't be going over those. I'm gonna start back at that financial planning task that we began the study with. And these are, this forms the basis for the monthly user charges. Way back in the fall, we talked about key financial assumptions and adjustments. And when we started this process, we had to identify and make sure we included it, these financial assumptions in our analysis. 
We worked with your uh, water services staff and management services staff and customer service in order to make sure that we had all these assumptions in line. So these include growth. We're assuming 1% account growth for water and wastewater. Reclaimed water is assuming no growth. We have reserve targets that need to be maintained, and that includes um, an operating reserve of 90 days of operations and maintenance expenses. There's also debt service coverage ratios that we must meet and other metrics, other financial targets that help us determine how much revenue needs to be collected from the funds each year. The base operating budgets we talked about last fall regarding the O&M or operations and maintenance budgets that are needed to pay your employees and operate your systems and pay for chemicals, et cetera. We also have cost escalation factors and CIP escalation. So we have those capital improvement program costs that are not only in today's dollars, but escalate over time. You'll see the different funding sources and we have brought up the major funding for projects such as the water supply security projects and the wastewater treatment plant expansion, which sources are not quite identified yet, but they, you know, they will be fleshed out over time. Back in the fall, we started with multiple financial scenarios. This is a recap of the scenarios that we brought to you in October, and they range all the way from your current, basically keep rates the same approach and fund the approved CIP that the finance team prepares in the five-year balance plan. Then we looked at a CPI or consumer price index increase that was a 5% increase annually, and that was able to fund a certain amount of operations and maintenance expenses and CIP. Then we had something called fix and go. So this was adjust your rates to the uh, level of inflation and then move on from there, and that turned out to be 8.5% rate increases each year. Then we had that scenario four, which is a levelized approach that would help fully fund the capital improvement program. So not just the approved capital improvements, but the unfunded projects and the informed projects from your master plans. So this is the scenario that we honed in on, but after discussing these plans with you, we came up with scenario five, which we're labeling the alternative option, and that's where we landed, and that's what drove the, all the results that you're seeing today. And this scenario five takes a look at fully funding the capital improvement projects, fully funding the base operating budget. However, the, um, level, the rate increases are levelized these rate increases also don't necessarily mean that's how everyone's rates will go up. And that's because we have to run this through the cost of service analysis and the rate structure analysis, which we recently went through. So you'll see that going forward. We'll start with the water fund and I'm just going to reiterate the uh, assumptions that we used when we walked through the financial plans for the water fund. Back at the beginning of the study, it was, this was 10 months ago, we had a forecast, a five-year financial outlook that um, has changed since then. However, that's where we started. So your um, management services team has since revised some funding sources and revised some estimates going forward for operations and maintenance expenses and loans, et cetera. So what we're seeing here is where we started the rate study. And this, at the start of the rate study, we were looking at a depletion of your cash reserves in the water fund. And as I mentioned, this was at the beginning of the study, so everything we looked at from that point to today has looked at bolstering those reserves, meeting all of your financial targets, and accomplishing that CIP program. This chart is new for you, we haven't shown you this yet, but it tells you and shows you the composition of annual operating expenses plus debt service over time. We are currently in the fiscal year 2024, so that's our first year here. And then the five-year plan for this rate study goes from fiscal year 2025 through 2029. Then we're showing the next four years through 2033 so that you have an idea for how we're forecasting costs to increase over time. 
We're showing the breakdown of personnel services, so that's salaries and wages and benefits. And then we show you variable operations and maintenance expenses, which include things like equipment maintenance and chemicals and electricity expenses, et cetera. Then the blue section are fixed operations and maintenance expenses. The majority of utilities costs are fixed. That's why you see that that's the largest piece of the puzzle here for each of these bars. So these are um, a lot of the, the other expenses that you have to operate and maintain your system. And then we have capital outlays. We have ongoing operating capital. We have machinery and equipment, et cetera. The debt service piece is that top section of the, the dark green section for the annual debt service that needs to be paid, both existing and projected. You've probably seen this before, this full CIP list for the water fund. This list includes not only the approved CIP projects that your finance team has brought to you, but also the informed capital improvement projects that have been on the books and in the forecast for a long time, plus some unfunded projects. This list does not include those large supply, water supply projects, by the way, but it does include in the asterisk projects, these are projects that are intended to be funding through grants. So your, your teams are really working hard to obtain grant funding, and they, there's a forecast of significant grant funding still moving forward. In total for this 10-year plan, in today's dollars, it's about $182 million. Of course, once we add escalation, that 4% escalation factor every year, that escalates to something a little bit higher, $214 million. <clears throat> Excuse me. This chart shows the breakdown of anticipated funding sources for that escalated capital improvement program each year. I'm going to reiterate that your management services and finance has actually come up with some additional or different funding options here. So the grant funding is a little different and the loan plan is, is forming. This is where we were looking to fund these projects through the fall. So it's not set in stone, as you know, these, these um, costs can change over time, but at the point of where we are today, we're expecting the majority of the capital improvements to be funded through cash or reserves. So it's not all annual rate revenues, it's reserves that have been built up over time. Then grants, revenue and from borrowing, and then capacity fees. The little table at the bottom shows you that it's about $20 million a year in escalated dollars that are planned to be funded through this program. You've seen this chart before. This represents the option that you directed us to follow last fall, which we're calling the alternative option. So it's a levelized plan for adjusting rates over time from 2025 through 2029 to achieve that full CIP funding level. Now I have to also mention that just because, and we've seen this, that just because I'm saying there's 15% rate adjustments, that doesn't mean that the rate increases are necessarily 15% for every person in this first year. So you'll see that as we look at the rates, that this 15% is a rate revenue adjustment that is needed to achieve those financial targets that we talked about and the capital improvement funding. We'll move on to the wastewater fund and you'll see the same charts, but just from the wastewater fund perspective. Back when we started the rate study 10 months ago, we were looking at a similar situation that without adjusting rates and looking at your approved capital improvements with escalation and a base budget adjustment for your operations and maintenance expenses, it looked like the cash balances were, were going to be depleted very quickly. And that's what drove this looking at alternative rate adjustments, just like we did for water. Again, this forecast has changed. Your management services team has adjusted these forecasts. But this is um, what drove the, the bulk of the study for wastewater. We're showing a similar chart for the composition of annual operating and maintenance expenses needed for wastewater, as well as 
the debt service that needs to be paid. So again, personnel services and fixed and variable operations and maintenance expenses, as well as capital outlay and debt service. The wastewater capital improvement program project list is a little less than water, but it's still significant. You'll see the projects include some um, pretty significant projects, so aging infrastructure replacements that are planned annually, and the Rio solids treatment project, et cetera. So there are um, quite significant projects on this list, including some unfunded estimates. We're showing these all together in one list, but as you know, these are scheduled to be needed over time. The total in today's dollars is 116 million. When you apply escalation to that total, it's 144 million that needs to be funded over the next 10 years in wastewater. And we're expecting, again, approximately $94 million to be funded through reserves or cash from rates. Um, no grants are projected here, but some borrowing through uh, revenue-funded lo loans. And then capacity fees are a good portion of these expenses. I'd like to note that the, these projects do not include any geo bonded uh, debt. So anything that's any projects in the wastewater fund that are paid for through property taxes from the geo debt, that's not included in this analysis. It's external to all of this. Showing a similar forecast here for the wastewater fund. This one is a little more significant in the first two years. It's a 25% rate revenue adjustment for the first two years. Then it drops down to 15% and then 10% adjustments. This is needed to be able to fund that levelized capital improvement program and the operations and maintenance expenses. Lastly, we have reclaimed. Reclaimed shows a similar picture when we started looking at the study. We are looking at a little bit more time to use the reserves and the cash balances to fund their reclaim program, but then over time it was expected to level off and, and deplete the, the cash reserves without a rate increase. But as we know, we've talked about this, that reclaimed water rates are currently a percentage of the potable water rates. So as you adjust your potable water rates, the reclaimed water rate adjustments will go into effect and therefore fund more capital projects and be able to sustain the fund through time. We have a similar table for a similar chart showing the, comp the composition of expenses. There's no debt in the reclaimed water fund currently, so you don't see any debt service bar, but you'll see again the fixed operations and maintenance expenses are the, the largest piece of these annual expenses. The full reclaimed water project list comprises about $57 million of project costs in today's dollars. That includes um, some, some projects that are funded through loans, future loans and, um, and hopefully grants. In today's, excuse me, in escalated dollars and limited to the amount that could be funded with the proposed rate plan, that is about $11.3 million of projects that can be funded with the plan that we've been looking at over the past 10 months. All of that comes from reclaimed water sales. So 11.3 million is the plan for <clears throat> the version that we're going forward with. Similar to the other funds, we're showing you that forecast of rate projections and because of the current policy the, that is limiting those reclaimed water rates to the potable water rate increases, we're showing those at 15% increases. We've discussed over the past few months that the reclaimed water fund is funded, is fully funded. It's not being subsidized. It's just that the capital improvement projects that I showed you, that bigger list, is not able to be funded with these this level of rate adjustments. And we, I, we heard from you from our last meeting that 
you would like the city to, or the water services, to research and to look, dig into the reclaimed water rates and look more into how to adjust those rates if needed. I'm going to keep moving on to capacity fees, if that's all right. This is a lot of material that you've seen over the past few months. I hope it, these are good memories. The capacity fee section of the study takes a look at another section of your customers. These are your brand new customers, so new connections to the system. You might recall that there are three industry accepted approaches to calculating capacity fees. These are the buy-in method, the incremental method, and then a combined method that looks at both of those. So the buy-in method looks historically at your investments in your current system and the capacity available in your current system. The incremental method looks forward. That looks at your capital improvements that are intended for to, to expand your capacity in the system. The combined method looks at both. So you um, directed us to look at the combined method. So the combined method for water capacity fees and wastewater capacity fees takes into account historical system investments and then that future growth related capital improvements. Please note on this slide, we're not showing the large capital projects costs and, and that will come into the fee in a second. The second important piece of our discussion regarding capacity fees was the level of service discussion. Level of service is the assumed capacity of a new connection. And there are a number of ways you could look at this. We could use the design standards that are in city code, or we could use an actual use level of service that more closely reflects your recent water usage characteristics and household characteristics. After review of those two methods, you directed us to look at the actual use level of service, where we're looking at an assumption of 335 gallons per day per equivalent residential unit for water. And then on the wastewater side, we're looking at both components of usage, so 257 gallons per day of capacity for wastewater flow, plus a loadings or strength component of 0.67 um, pounds per day of loadings for a typical connection to your system. By using those, met those factors, that's how we can calculate how much one new connection should pay to buy in and to also pay for the cost of growth in your systems. When we talked with you about capacity fees a few months, months ago and we talked to the Water Commission, there were some, a few key points that we asked for direction and you provided. As I mentioned, you directed us to use the combined methodology for calculating the fees, which we've done. Then use the system actuals as the basis for the level of service of how much one new connection requires. Then you, act, you asked us to to include the cost of future water supply infrastructure projects in the water capacity fee calculation. So that would give water services the ability to start collecting for those future uh, projects, those future water supply projects. Next, at the same level on the wastewater side, you gave us direction to calculate capacity fees so that water services could start collecting fees towards the cost of a new wastewater treatment facility. So those are all factors we're going to talk about. And then finally, we're going to include a factor of loadings or strengths of wastewater flow into that capacity for wastewater connections. Out of all those projects that I showed you earlier that were water-related projects, water fund projects, this is the list that includes a, some component for growth, whether all for new customers or a portion. So you'll see that out of this list, there's a, about $70.5 million of your 10-year CIP projects that are growth-related on the water side, plus approximately $230 million for future water supply projects. Those were the costs of the future projects that we included in this capacity fee calculation. 
this table we presented during one of our meetings, and what's highlighted in orange is your selected or preferred approach for water capacity fees. We called it 1B, which was future water supply and using the actual, actual usage for level of service. That takes the existing capacity fee for a three quarter inch water meter of $5,728 to $8,146. We have a, again, we are showing the increase for a two inch commercial meter as well. The actual capacity fee schedule is based on water meter size, and this table all the way at the end shows the proposed fees by water meter size. You'll see that just for, for comparison's sake, the majority of your current customers are three quarter inch water meters, because those are residential sizes, but also a lot of commercial customers have three quarter inch meters, and this just shows their average monthly usage. So this is information that you had requested before. An ERU factor is an equivalent residential use factor, so this means that different meter sizes have different equivalencies, and that's actually how we calculated the proposed fees. We take the three-quarter inch meter fee and we multiply it by the ERU factor to get that dollar amount. If, a, if one of your connections is seeking to increase capacity, so increase the size of its meter, then the, the fee is the difference between the two meter sizes. So the new meter versus the existing meter. So it's not an additional fee, it's just that incremental fee. Moving on to wastewater, we have that similar list of projects that has either entirely a growth related component or a, it looks like 50% is pretty common for these projects. So at least a portion of all these projects is <clears throat> attributable to growth or expansions of the system, and that's about $38.2 million, plus the wastewater treatment plan expansion, which as I mentioned is again, it's as yet um, not determined yet for the total funding source, but it is identified as being growth related. So we would um, fund that in the capacity fees. We presented you with a lot of options on the wastewater side. There were eight. And you directed us to, to look at 1D, which is using or including the wastewater treatment expansion costs in the capacity fee calculation, using the actual level of service with flows and a loadings component. So given all that, the fee itself has um, for a three quarter inch residential meter is not that large of an increase, but it is an increase from $3,723 per connection to 4,086. Then you also see an increase on the commercial or the higher meter size. A better way to look at it would be this table, which again, just like for the water side, is based on water meters and water equivalent meters. So this shows you the proposed wastewater fees by meter size. It is important to note that for larger meter sizes, we recommend that your water services take a look at that individual customer's needs because we're looking at flows and loadings rather than apply just a standard factor to that account, like say the, the meter's a four inch meter. The type of unit or type of customer that that four inch meter represents is important in factoring the appropriate capacity fee. Another note is that in your current capacity fee schedule for wastewater, you'll notice that for all of the residential, single family residential connections, three quarter inch, one inch, one and a half inch, the fee is the same. And that is what we are still proposing, that you keep that fee for single family residential at the three quarter inch level. The reason behind that is because typically when a single family residential purchases a larger water meter, it's for outdoor irrigation purposes rather than indoor water use that would contribute to wastewater flow. So the equivalent wastewater usage is still assumed to be that associated with a three quarter inch meter. And then on the other side, the multifamily connections. 
Multifamily connections are billed based on per unit. So if regardless of the connection in that multifamily unit, regardless of that water connection size, the fee is assigned as a three quarter inch meter per unit. So if it's a 12 unit apartment complex, there would be 12 times 4,086 rather than the meter size based fee. That's how you currently assess that type of charge and that's we're proposing no change to that. Capacity fees are done. The next section is something that we haven't discussed yet. This is the miscellaneous service fees. Miscellaneous service fees are those fees that are charged for non-volume um, or non-water um, and wastewater hookups. So, not, I shouldn't say hookups. These are things like if you, have, um, if you have a late payment or if you get disconnected and you want to be reconnected or if you have a permit for your scavenger waste that you're bringing to the wastewater treatment plant. These are all services that water services staff and customer services perform, and we want to make sure that those fees are set appropriately so that they don't have to be recovered in the water and wastewater rates. When we look at miscellaneous fees and we update these fees, we talk to staff members and we ask what activities are performed during that service so we could determine who performs the service, how many hours are spent, and how much really does that cost. So we build up the cost for those fees. We have a cost template. Stantec has a lot of models, financial models, Excel models, so we compile this information in a model and calculate a fee for that service. Then we talk to staff about the implications of charging that cost-based service. There could be a rationale for not charging 100% of that cost recovery. And during our conversations, we discussed things, and I'll, I'll bring up one in particular when I get to that in the table. I'm going to start with water meter installations. So when a new connection is um, coming to the city to put in a, a new connection, new household, new business, a water meter needs to be purchased and installed. These fees have not been adjusted for quite a few years. I think the latest may have been in 2010, if I'm not mistaken. So the cost of meters has gone up like everything. We talked with um, water services staff about the cost of meters by size, the labor needed to install these meters, and any other equipment like using a truck. So those are all the things that go into calculating this fee. The table here shows the current fee per connection, and then the pro proposed fee. For a three quarter inch meter, that proposed fee is, is $596 higher than what's currently charged. And that is primarily the cost of the water meter itself. So that's um, the cost of that, of that equipment and labor. So you'll see that um, there are corresponding increases for the different meter sizes. Anything larger than two inches, so a three inch meter or four inch meter should be at cost. So your uh, water services team knows how much those meters cost to purchase and install. So that's I have, water meter I have a quick question. Is this included in the hookup fees that we're discussing or is this a separate um, miscellaneous charge in addition to the hookup fee? So, Mayor, if you're referring to the capacity fees, it, it's separate. So, this is a set. This is the cost for that actual physical connection. The capacity fee covers the cost of capacity that's being built in the system. Next, we're looking at service charges, and the majority of these are charged through customer service. In addition to updating these fees, we're proposing with the customer service department, uh, a change in the, the name of the fee. So the current code has different names for these fees. Turn on, turn off fees is one that you'll see. And it really is called a water service establishment fee. So setting up a new service for a new account. And this would be the next business day. Currently, the fee is $24 based on the cost we feel it should be $45, which is uh, $21 higher. If a customer requires 
a establishment of service that day, that same day, that puts additional pressures on staff. So we looked at it in terms of a $20 surcharge on top of the $45 fee for water service establishment. So that to total fee would be $65. And that's just a little bit of clarity in how customer service charges for these same day um, requests. The collection or non-payment charge is an example of where when we calculated the full cost of service, it was much higher than 40, the $45 that we're proposing to be charged. The rationale for charging something less than 100% of full cost recovery is that oftentimes the customer is, is um, a, a delinquent or to shut off for non-payment. Mm -hmm. And if that is because of a, um, mm -hmm. a burden on that customer for paying water bills, mm -hmm. we don't want to exacerbate the burden by putting yet another fee on them. Mm -hmm. So we want a, f a fee that is, mm -hmm. that happens to me all the time. <laughs> um, okay. <clears throat> So this is just a, a reason to collect less than 100% of what the cost tell us that should be for a, um, a good policy and rationale. The other charges on this page are proposed to stay the same. In talking with staff, they felt that meter testing, backflow prevention, et cetera, are at the right level. The next table are Fees that are associated with uh, the industrial pretreatment program, so on the wastewater side, and this is a whole section in your code, and it has to do with um, pretreatment discharges and scavenger waste. So the industrial pretreatment discharge fee is actually a five-year permit, and there are about um, six or eight pretreatment customers who have to pay this permit every five years. It's a staggered fee, but Currently, that fee over five years is $1,250. We found in talking with staff that that is severely under recovering the actual costs that are incurred to monitor the, the, these um, industrial customers. So uh, the proposed fee is um, $1,950. That represents the cost of escalated escalation from the last time the fees were changed, I think in 2020, to, to today. So a five is actually a five to 2025, so a five year adjustment for inflation. And again, another reason for less than 100% of cost recovery would be that those costs would be quite high. As you could see, the just 1950 is only 3% of the 100% cost recovery. The next three sections are called scavenger waste. So these are septic haulers, you know, so from septic tank discharges, restaurant grease, and mud sump discharges. These fees are in a per $100 charge. And currently the scavenger waste are, uh, for septage are $8 per 100 gallons. We're proposing that fee be changed and increased to $11 as, um, and restaurant Grease would be the same at $11. Oftentimes, a, a truck will bring in waste that is not distinguished between restaurant grease or septic waste. So that um, charge per 100 gallons would be the same for both to avoid um, undercharging for one. And then the uh, mud sup waste cost is, a, is re, uh, proposed to increase by $6. There are after hours fees and scavenger waste permit fees that we are proposing here as well. One more page on miscellaneous fees. Should I pause or keep going? Yeah, if we can just take a quick pause. Okay. We're good to go. Sorry for the interruption. 
I'm sure mayor and council like the little break. <laughs> the last table that I'm going to go over for miscellaneous fees are sewer surcharge rates. You have some customers, some industri industries, who have high strength wastewater discharge. Based on their current rates and limits on how much they can discharge into the system, a surcharge is assessed when that waste exceeds that discharge rate. So the current fee, and remember we have BOD, which is biochemical oxygen demand, and TSS, which is total suspended solids. Those are the measures of strength in a wastewater. So if that discharge is over a certain limit, there is an additional amount, or that surcharge is, is assessed to that flow for that customer. Based on the results of the cost of service study, we feel that both of those charges for BOD and TSS should increase, and the increase is roughly 15, 15 cents, excuse me, per pound of discharged waste for, of an increase for both of those. That aligns that, that um, surcharge with the cost of service results. In your code, you actually charge extra high and really high strength, so a doubling of the surcharge and a tripling of the surcharge for really high wastewater discharge strength. But that is an uncommon pra practice in the industry, and really uh, the, the 500th milligram per liter versus the 300 or the 350 milligram per liter doesn't I mean it, it's not really that significant, that different of a cost. So we're proposing that those charges get eliminated and we just have you assign one surcharge rate for each of these components and change the code accordingly. Do you have any other questions on miscellaneous fees before I move on? Councilmember Matthews, you had a question. Is it about everything or is it okay? Anyone else have a question about what we've discussed so far? Okay, go ahead. Okay. The last section, probably the one most fresh in your mind, are the cost of service rates and rate designs. We saved these for last because, again, these are <clears throat> monthly user rates make up the largest proportion of revenues for the water, wastewater, and reclaimed water funds. When we met at the end of last year, we talked to you about your priorities for rate structures and rates. These were revenue stability, conservation, demand management, administrative burden, and proportionality between and within classes that used to be called equity, and then affordability. So we wanted to make sure that when we talked about rate structures, rate designs for water and wastewater, we covered and accounted for your priorities. When we started talking about water rates, we presented you with three options and then a revised option. So we started with option one that essentially was the same as your current rate structure, but that we just adjusted the amount of revenue that you would recover from your base or fixed charges so that you would put more of a price signal on that volume rate part of your rate structure. So this would give customers a, a larger price signal that when the more water they use, the higher their bill would be. Option two took that option one and built upon it. We looked at changing the residential tiers, and I won't go into all of the details if, unless you prefer I do, but at this point we made a small adjustment in order to adjust the residential tiered structure. Option three took Option two, with the change in residential tiers, and then it suggested a combination of two classes to simplify the rate structure and the administration of that particular rate. Based on our joint meeting between you and the Water Commission, a third, uh, the third option was revised to further refine that residential tiered approach, and that's what we'll talk about tonight. On the wastewater side, we had, again, three options, and those three options increased in 
the, um, in accomplishing those priorities. So we started with a cost of service option with the same rate structure that you currently have, which would be no fixed charge, only volume rates by customer type. Then in option two, we added that fixed charge, very similar to what you are currently doing in water. And we said, let's have you recover 25% of your revenue requirements through a fixed charge on the sewer side to enhance revenue stability, and then also have individual volume rates for the rest of the customer classes. And then finally, option three was option two, but consolidate those volume charges based on customer type. That's what we'll talk about tonight. The chart on this page shows the two components of your water rate structure with the proposed option three revised. I'll walk through this. And we're only showing the inside city rates here. Remember, outside city customers get a 10% surcharge on, their, on the inside city rates. These rates also exclude taxes and the energy rate, the energy fee that is charged to water customers. On the water side, we have the monthly fixed meter charges. These are those meter charges by meter size, the current fixed meter charges in this first column. And then we're proposing for 2025 that the 25% um, of the costs for the water fund be recovered through a fixed charge. Currently, you're recovering about 29% of your revenue requirement. We're proposing to reduce that that still maintains revenue stability, but it pushes more of the costs on the volume rates so that it provides a, a larger price signal for water conservation. The total bill is, would be, for a customer on the water side, would be the fixed meter charge plus the volume charges. So the volume charges are represented here on the right. Single family is the only customer class that we're proposing to have a tiered rate structure. There are four tiers. And the current tiers are in the column here with the asterisk. We're proposing in 20, fiscal year 25 to recover 75% of your revenue requirements from the volume rates. And the, the rates would be um, according to these tiers and these tier ratios. The second adjustment on this rate structure would be that commercials and schools and institutional customers would be combined into one class and paying the same rate per 1,000 gallons of water use. That is the proposed water rate structure. The water rate schedule for the next five years is presented on, in these charts, so the top component is the monthly fixed charge. So you have your current fixed charge. Again, we're only showing inside city rates because there are inside and outside. And then we see that the first rate adjustment would be effective September 1st of this year. So September 1st, 2024. And that would run all the way through December 31st, 2025. So the same rates for more than 12 months. And then the next rate adjustment would be effective January 1 of 2026. And then you see the rest of the schedule here the volume rates would follow the same schedule. We've shown you some projected average bill impacts previously, but we have these aligned a little differently so that you could see a representative customer for each of the customer classes. So a representative meter size along with an average monthly build volume. Given that water meter size that corresponds to that fixed meter charge and the average water bill volume that corresponds to the volume rate, we can calculate a total bill and compare it from one year to the next. So the current year, fiscal year 24, average water bill, as an example, this particular single family user would pay $30.91. Given the next adjustment to the rate structure and the rates for starting uh, September 1 of this year, that total bill would go up to $32.04 or a dollar and 13 change in a month. That's a 3.7% change. The next year, the rate would go up by 
the point here is that when you do a cost of service analysis, you adjust your rates by customer class based on those costs of service. Then until you have your next cost of service study, you can apply that across the board percentage rate increase to everyone. So you'll see that in, for the first adjustment, effective September 1, 2024, the percentage changes and the dollar changes, of course, are different for every representative customer. The largest impacted user would be a one inch landscape meter with 24,000 gallons of water used. So that would be the largest increase, but thereafter, everyone would see a 15% increase through 2029 in their annual change in their bills. So we do not have a percentage change column here, we just show that at the top. That's a lot of data. Councilmember McCarthy has a question. So um, a large industrial, or excuse me, institutional, that would be like NAU? Um, Mayor and the University. Councilmember McCarthy, yes. So they're getting a pretty good hit. Uh, 37.9%. Well, I guess <clears throat> my gut reaction is that's a little high but to get into it, then we have to go back to all the little details that we've been talking about for the last hour to change that. But uh, I don't know. I'll just put that out there for a conversation. Thank you. I'll keep going. On the wastewater rate side, I'm going to show you similar tables. We have the uh, proposed wastewater rate structure that is a, proposes a fixed monthly meter charge and a consolidated volume rate schedule. On, again, the total bill would be a composite of that fixed monthly charge each month and the volume charge according to the, the class that you represent. So on the left, we have the monthly fixed meter charges by meter size, so these are water meters we have that same equivalent residential unit factor that I mentioned before for capacity fees. And in fiscal year 2025, that proposed fixed charge would recover 25% of the annual revenue requirements for the wastewater fund. On the volume side, the color coding represents the consolidated classes. So residential customers are residential multifamily customers paying um, 550 per thousand gallons. Non-residential A, B, and C represent a combination of volume and strength of wastewater flow. So we've combined these classes according to their concentrations of their flows and their, their total loadings. So you'll see that car washes, laundromats, et cetera, through hotels and motels are combined into non-residential A. Non-residential B includes higher strength customers and then non-residential C is in a class by itself at the highest level here. Just as in water, we're projecting those rates going forward. And again, this is that five-year schedule for inside city only. For the top chart, these are the fixed charges that are new, so you don't have any fixed charges currently, so we just start with the September 1st, 2024 um, list of fixed charges. And then the proposed volume charges are condensed into the consolidated classes. We have a lot of information on this chart that you might want to take some time looking at. It's the same type of average bill impacts for this rate option. And these are for, again, representative wastewater customers. Some customers, you'll see, some customer types will actually see a decrease in their monthly bills for this first year. 
That is because we are, again, aligning the costs of service for 2025, fiscal year 25. This cost of service analysis hasn't been done for a while, and rates haven't been adjusted on the wastewater side since 2020. So this is a, it may look like a significant change, but it is because the longer you go between your cost of service resetting, the, the bigger the differences are. However, going forward, after this initial adjustment, all customers should see the same increase each year. So 25% increase in 2026, and then 15%, 10%, and 5% thereafter. So it's a big impact in these first couple years, but then it's projected to level out. I'm going to keep moving. We have a few more slides. There are two sample bills that are on the um, Clean Water Flagstaff website, and we talked to you about this a, f a few months ago. But this shows the full municipal services bill for a residential customer using 4,550 gallons per month. This breaks down the bill into the different components that they see. So a base water meter charge, the tiered residential water charges, the energy surcharge, et cetera. So you'll see in yellow, these are the charges we were just talking about, the rates for water, the rates for wastewater that we were just talking about. The 2024 column shows what their, this customer would be paying today in a bill today, and then what that proposed bill would be next year, so or the next, starting in September 2020, fiscal year 25, and then at fiscal year 29. So fast forward to the end of the rate projection period. We know that the energy surcharge and the water protection fee will change over time. So right now we're just assuming they're the same, but they're asterisk because we know that they will, they will change. But a, one, a bill today that's $101.90 would increase to 100, approximately $115.94, and then up to $168.20 by 2029. We just wanted to give you an idea of what a, a typical bill might look like in the future. Of course, use changes in usage and changes in these other fees could make these forecasted bills different. We show the same type of bill for a commercial user. This commercial user happens to have a three-quarter inch water meter and over 51,000 gallons of monthly water use. So you'll see their bill components are very similar to what we just showed you for residential, but the total impact is different over time. We have one more component to rates, and those are the reclaimed water rates. We reviewed these most recently a couple weeks ago. So we're just showing that the reclaimed water rates for now are proposed to be or projected to be in line with the water, the potable water rates for option three revised. Those were the rates that I showed you just a few minutes ago. So the reclaimed water rates on the monthly fixed charge side are the same as potable water. So if you have a three quarter inch reclaimed water meter, you pay the same monthly fixed charge. On the volume side, however, the reclaimed water rates are a function of the potable water rate, the volume rate, plus the energy rate. So if you try to take your calculator and calculate that percentage of the potable water rate, we talked about this before, you have to add in the potable water rate plus the energy rate in order to get that um, basis for the reclaimed water rate. That was a lot of material. We covered the financial plans, we covered capacity fees, miscellaneous fees, and monthly user charges or user rates. All of these fees work together to help support and fund and keep your water services going. Water, reclaimed water, and wastewater. It's a lot of information, and I, I know you'll have some questions, so I don't know if you want me to Pause for questions before we talk about our requested action for you tonight.
Councilmember Matthews, you were the one with the first question. Would you like to ask it now? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I know tonight on the agenda, we're just um, making a decision on whether to go through the legal process of posting that we're gonna consider water rates. I have a lot of questions. You see my dining room table. I have the 77 pages <laughs> of detailed information spread out. Um, there's a lot of things that don't reconcile with me. Um, population growth. Um, we had a lot of discussion on that from the hospital's plans to um, presentation from Econa and stuff. And none of, them, none of them come close to the population growth that we're projecting here. Um, and also, if those projected growth rates are in ad, um, incorrect, that impacts our growth-related CIP. Um, so I really want to feel warm and fuzzy -er about it. Um, also, capacity fees, if I understand it, are associated with paying for that growth um, in usage of our water and stuff. I see some big numbers here. So I, I would kind of, not kind of, I really, I mean, I spent 40 years analyzing presentations and spreadsheets and financials, and my head hurts. Um, and it's hard to do it up here, uh, listening to the presentation. You've done a fabulous job of just trying to break it out into, you know, segments so we can try to digest it. I know Aaron's worked on it hard as well. And I appreciate that. I just, I don't think right now I can have a discussion with our community and say with confidence that I'm confident about, I am confident that we need these uh, projects, I, I am confident that we kicked a lot of these projects down the road for years. I can say that. But, um, you know, this is, this is a, an amazing no growth strategy. I mean, we are already very expensive to live here. And I, when the community starts here, starts being able to use modeling scenarios, which you all told me you guys would have up and running soon, I think they will, maybe I'll be wrong and they'll be, oh yeah, I can afford, you know, an extra million dollars a year if they're, you know, NAU or somebody else. I don't think so. I think they'll be as worried about it as I am. Um, and so I really would like somehow to have just a work session where we're not just, you're doing a presentation, other presenters are waiting to do their thing. Um, you know, I, I want to, I want to ask and, and have numbers like what if we, you know, moved it out a seven year or 10 year plan? What if we took out projects like Red Gap Branch? What if we, you know, projects that aren't even on the books for 10 more years? And what if, what if, what if, what does that look like? And have a more relaxed public meeting to have those conversations so that we can all, um, you know, feel better about the pain um, of these increased rates and know that we exhausted all um, questions and conversations um, so we can feel confident when we're talking to our community about the process. Um, you know, it's hard to stay not uh, glazed over. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. But um, if we could do that, and I know time is running out, we're going to, you know, we're, if we move this today to, uh, post the rate change, we've got, you know, a very short amount of time to really go through everything and, and ask the questions and, and find out the answers and run some scenarios. And so I think it's going to take more than just an hour or two presentation on the dais where we could just dedicate, I don't know what that looks like, if that's acceptable with the city manager or not, but I just, I, I, I don't know how to get my head around this and I've got it all spread out in my I got a list of questions already, but you know, to have those back and forth and have those answered and go, okay, then what about this? And that's just what I'd like to ask. So Mayor and Councilmember Matthews, I think that's a great idea from what I understand and I would defer to um, Director Jones. Did, I believe we do have some time and that tonight if you approve the 
the um, notice of intention to change rates, then it, perhaps we could set up some of those work sessions that where we could dig into those what ifs. Would that be? Okay. Well, and I'll ask, also ask Stacy. Um, what, because I know that our agendas for the next couple of meetings are really packed, what is the, um, what's the process if we were to have a work session on a different day and this was the only topic? I think it's something that's very doable, Mayor. Um, I, you know, I think it's a good idea to try to separate this conversation out from a regular meeting that's full of other things that definitely need to be um, with, you know, action taken on it. So it would just be a matter of, of finding a date that works um, for the council, that works for staff and our consultants. Um, but it's a doable option for sure. Sterling. Mayor, from a legal perspective, any number of work sessions is permissible prior to that June 18th public hearing date uh, to make sure the council is comfortable with what's being presented on that date and the public um, is aware so thank you. and we don't need a quorum right if we're just going to be asking questions and and there's no decision making or do we still need a quorum for a work <laughs> session yes yeah was sterling squirming as much as i was yes you would need an agenda minutes full quorum of council it would All be right. an actual meeting okay um, Shannon. Yeah, I mean, maybe just to take that conversation a bit further, if you were looking for something like a town hall, similar to what we did at the East um, Flagstaff Library, where folks can come and ask questions, we can walk them through the calculator, and council would participate in that. I think that that's one format versus having an, an official work session. So depending on which one works best for you, I think we can accommodate both. Um, I was also going to recommend Councilmember Matthews. I think it's very helpful um, if we can sit down with council members, look at the same papers that you're looking at, track what your questions are, um, help to provide that clarity. It also allows us to map those questions over into um, the information that we're presenting and pulling together for community education. Um, because if you have the question, the likelihood is that somebody else might have that same question. Um, so being able to provide clarity to you as a council member so that you can help others understand that you're talking with and then for us to be able to replicate the same, I think is very helpful in this process. That, that's why I've been making a list. I didn't want to Great. set up a meeting until I digested you're ready. the yeah. information that was emailed to me last week. So yeah. um, that would be great as well. Just On, in addition, know. because I know that as our community members are kind of waking up to like, oh, wait, what do you, you know, what are you saying, this rate and stuff, how does that impact me? I think they're going to have a lot more questions and I want to make sure we're as transparent as possible mm -hmm. and that we've provided, um, and I know staff has done a great job of, you know, there's, I see it every day, you know, learn more about the water rate study and stuff, but I, you know, people get busy and it just goes over their heads and I think they're going to wake up with sticker shock if we don't really uh, dig into this and get our questions answered and have a, a forum where you know, our community can ask questions to in an official capacity. Yeah, and all the advertising and the outreach that we've been talking to you and show you examples, that ramps up this week. Um, so we're really encouraging folks to try it out and give us their feedback, ask us the questions, because that's how we make sure that folks are informed and comfortable with the, what we're doing moving forward. Is the calculator available now? It is. Mm -hmm. That encompasses all the different rate water reclaimed and wastewater into one bill? Um, it has the water and the wastewater. Um, it does not have the reclaimed piece of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Harris. Thank you, Mayor. I think what I heard Councilmember Matthews say, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councilmember Matthews, you were talking or speaking about scenarios. What if we took out this? What would this look like? What if we took out this? I don't think she was asking for different rates. I think she was asking about scenarios, how we could make this less expensive. Is that right? Yes, just to clarify different scenarios, not only just taking, because I know everything has been communicated to us, 
is important, although there's that big chunk of unfunded, unrecognized projects. It's like, what is that? You know, if you don't even know what they are yet, you know, why are we putting them in? But also, what if those what ifs? What if this wasn't a uh, five-year escalation? What if it was a smaller escalation over a 10-year time or seven-year time? Or what if we took out some things or, you know, let's talk about why you don't project any federal grant funding. I know we're running out of money, so that's probably the answer, but just having those questions asked and answered and running those scenarios like Councilmember Harris said to say, what if we take this out? What does that look like? Councilmember House. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just along those same lines in terms of the different scenarios, I think one of the big concerns that um, I'm feeling in looking at these rates, especially as it's, it's coming together, is um, not only the impact to uh, like the institutions that we, we clearly saw here, um, but also as we were talking about even something like the, the water hookups and um, some of those costs, um, I'm thinking immediately of affordability across the board. Um, what that, that sort of change does to housing affordability um, what the impact may be for our uh, different institutions that are providing services, whether it's educational services or otherwise, um, the potential impacts for the affordability of things like the university or, or um, other services. And so um, I'm wondering how much plans like this and this sort of study takes those sort of impacts into account um, if there's if there's ways for a study like this to do that, or um, if that's more of the conversation that we're hoping to have coming up is looking at those, those uh, potential implications specific to some of those organizations or some of that work and, and building out some of those potential scenarios of impact. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council Member House. When we're doing these cost of service analyses, especially if they haven't been um, addressed in quite a while, we often see these large impacts. You know, if you're looking at some of the other Arizona communities that we've worked with, like the town of the, or Surprise, City of Surprise is looking at 50% rate increases. These, these adjustments are shocking, and sometimes it is a matter of other policies that need to be considered in order to address those issues. So is there an affordable housing policy that perhaps you waive a certain capacity fee? You know, granted, whenever you are providing that kind of a, um, a benefit, it's gotta come from somewhere, right? You have to, when you push in the balloon on one side, it pops out on the other because water services still needs those funds to operate and to, to build its program. So I, I would say that when we can run scenarios, but I think we have to be um, also considering some other policies that might need to be reviewed when it comes to affordability of service. And I know we, we've talked in the past about other social ag service agencies providing some assistance to customers that have trouble or burdens you know, on their just cost of housing and cost of paying water and sewer bills. So if that would, um, if that would help with what you're, what you're concerned about, then I would say we could add that to our discussion. Uh, yeah, very much so. I think it's, it's a really essential part of the conversation for me um, because as we're looking at this and um, particularly as we're looking at these rates and these changes as ways of not only um, ensuring the stability of our water and, and um, meeting those community needs, but also looking at it in terms of smart growth as a city. Um, that's another aspect of it in, in my mind is um, how it's impacting the other services that we're able to provide, how it's impacting the cost of housing overall, and all of those sorts of things um, that if we're making changes in one area, recognizing the impact that it has in others and how we might inadvertently be hindering some of those goals um, if we don't take them into consideration. So I'd, I'd very much like to see it be part of um, that next conversation as we start 
building out some of those scenarios and looking at uh, what those possibilities are for managing these impacts. Council Member Sweet. Thank you, Mayor. I just had a couple of thoughts to offer up. I did meet with Shannon, Shannon and Aaron, and I asked a lot of the questions that we're kind of going through tonight, and I found it very, very helpful. Um, but it did, you know, lead to more questions. So I think with this aggressive plan, you know, we do need to do this. I understand that. But for our community, I do think we should have another meeting where this is what we're talking about. And I'm wondering if we can frame our questions and get them to staff and to you, um, Carol, beforehand so that you can come up with the scenarios. It's impossible for me to ask at the meeting to map that out. It would, you know, I think it would be good if we had that to you ahead of time so that we can kind of frame out what that meeting can look like. Um, and I don't know if that's possible, but I do think having another work session separate would be a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Harris. I, I think um, what we're talking about, um, and I don't know, it, it seems like you have a lot of expertise, like a lot. I'm not sure if we're at the, that, you, well, how do we, take this in the spirit that it's given. So if someone is asking you, what about this scenario? And it may not come from us. It may come from someone that's at that meeting. Would you be able to do that there and give them that answer? Or would you have to say, let me get back to you? And the only reason that I'm asking you that is that if we really want to be truly transparent, then we have to be able to let folks come in and, and ask those questions and not us, you know, uh, direct the conversation because it really is about them not the seven of us. So they have to be able to ask those what ifs, and then we have to be able to answer them. Now, I can sit down with everyone and get a good understanding of what this is all about, but that doesn't reach the other 20 or 30,000 people or whoever, how many ever is gonna potentially um, do this. So if we could do something like that, and then we could film it, video it, like we do our, our meetings, um, and then people could go back later and watch, and perhaps some of their questions that someone else asked would have been answered. All I'm trying to do is just get us to a point where we can do this in the most efficient way because the bottom line is that we got a time crunch. And so whatever it is that, that we do, we got to do it pretty quickly um, because, and, and, and then we have to be willing to whatever happens, we're going to have to be willing to bite the bullet whatever way that is. I don't know what is going to come out of that. So probably not a good analogy, but <laughs> so thank you. So what I'm hearing you say, Council Member Harris, is that um, Shannon had, had um, said that we could either have a work session or we can, could combine it with the public meeting that staff already has planned, and I'm hearing you say that they really should be separate because that should be just the community asking questions. But then I think we all would like to have a work session where we can dig into these questions as well. And there were two points made about questions ahead of time. Um, would that be helpful? to you in preparing, um, or can you go with um, questions presented to you um, at, the, at the work session? So, Mayor and um, all council members, I, we, we have a model that is meant to run scenarios on the fly. However, I would appreciate scenarios developed ahead of time. That would be very helpful. But in answer to Councilmember Harris's question about would I be able to run something that someone comes up with, I would like to believe yes. There's always something that you know we can't do, but you know if it is within the parameters of you know costs, you know timing, um, different levers that we've included in our modeling, then that's what we love to do. That's what you're able to do. 
So if we could have a combination, well, combination, if we could have prepared scenarios, that would be fantastic. And if something else comes up at that time, um, now I want to be careful because I could get us into the weeds really quickly. So I'll have to think about how to keep it so that I don't make your eyes glaze over even more. But I, I would like to believe that we could accomplish this in a, a separate work se session. Councilmember McCarthy. Thank you, Mayor. I think a lot of this discussion is basically sitting on the foundation of sticker shock. It's like, oh my God, how much are you going to raise my rates? So if somebody doesn't like that, there's only two ways to change that. Put the burden onto someone else or something else, or determine that we don't need to do some of the projects. So. It's one thing to say, I hate this, it should be less, but uh, that conversation, that's only half the conversation. It's like, okay, you don't like it, where do you want, where do you, where do you want it? I like your analogy of you push on the balloon and it goes in here, but then it pushes out on the other side. That's exactly what we're up against. We spent a lot of time setting priorities of, you know, do we want to, charge more on the base rate or should we charge more on the uh, per gallon rate and uh, you know you can change that back but uh, it's it's a zero-sum game unless we can cut projects out and I don't think that's really on the table um, if it is let me know but um, I'm thinking it probably is not uh oh Shannon's coming up <laughs> thanks <laughs> No, Mayor, Council Members, no, I appreciate um, Council Member McCarthy, I think even where you're going, um, I think you're touching on some good points that may be a little bit overlooked as we kind of get into the weeds, we get distracted, but on the water on the water side, I think a point to be emphasized is there's a dramatic change that Council gave direction in the model for the water rate structure. Currently, we were, we were collecting 29% of our revenues to the base rate, and you lowered that to 25% which puts power back into the customer's hands. Um, we put less emphasis on the base and said, ultimately, because conservation is a core value, the more you can serve, you have control over what your final bill comes in. Sticker shock, when you look at the numbers, um, there's, man, there's so many scenarios and we average them. We take medians, we take modes to look at that. What it's not projecting is, when you look at the sticker shock, I would say the ones that are having sticker shock are the ones that are using large volumes of water. Granted, right, that is a secret shock, but another way to look at that would be is that's also a customer that has a lot of control over the destiny of what their water bill does look like. I just don't think that should be glazed over. I think that's an important concept, and I feel it's, it's integral to the way the model was built because that is a core value, right, of our community, is that conservation that's why the base rates were adjusted lower to give more power back. And that's why cost per thousand escalating up in that use comes at a premium. The sticker shock, I get that. Understanding the cause and effect of that is, again, when you're using, again, we, when you look at a, an individual using 4,000 gallons a month, I don't think you're, I don't feel like we're seeing the sticker shock there. You're using 4 million gallons a month there probably is a sticker shock. And so I think keeping that in context of um, what does that look like? What does the customer have power over? And then what does water services in the city's team provide as far as resources that can additionally help you be successful moving forward? Um, I also appreciated what you said about, um, yeah, the list of projects like tell me, right? And we can start there as opposed to, well, tell me what you can do in 10 years mainly because I also have sticker shock of a project that we're gonna be bringing before you for approval that started over 10 years ago. Over 10 years ago, that project was $3.5 million. And we didn't do it because that was too expensive. And every three years, that project has doubled in cost. Now I'm gonna be coming before you with a project that's no longer $3 million, right? It's somewhere between the magnitude of eight to 12 million. And me saying, man, I wish I would have done that 10 years ago, right? That was cheap. So when you draw out a project, I cannot predict into the future. 
but I can look at the last 10 years and see, you, and see escalations that again, about every three years, I feel like that project is doubling in cost. And if I don't do that project this year and I come back in three years, we probably won't be talking 10 to $12 million. That's what, that's what worries me. So again, the difference of, okay, well, let's just don't do it. Then that moves off the table, right? Telling me that, well, we should do that in five years. The sticker shock that we're seeing today is gonna be even, it's gonna be even greater. Um, so I think you were just touch, touching on a good couple of concepts that um, I wanted to highlight, like you were taking us down that path, and, um, and I appreciate you doing that. Thank you. And Shannon, I appreciate your, uh, your comments. I think they're right on. I was just trying to bring out the idea that, you know, we can't just reduce cost, uh, impacts. We have to move it to somewhere else. So if somebody says, well, let's reduce this, okay, where do you want to increase it? Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mayor. So, Councilmember Harris. Let me say one last thing. Um, exactly what you said is what the community needs to hear. And so that needs to be part of our conversation is that if I take it from here, where do you suggest I take it from? I had an institution ask me about this whole rate thing. And my, my response back to them is that, you know what? Can you figure out another way to do this? And so I think we need to ask folks, can you figure out another way to do If we're not the brightest light on the tree, maybe you are. And so if you can figure it out, tell us. You know, and if it works, great. If it doesn't, we haven't lost anything. So I say, let's, let's do this. Let's just get out there and see what happens. So I'm going to propose that we go into your recommendations and then we take public comment and then um, we give our final direction. Thank you, Mayor. With that, we are to our requested action and adoption of the notice of intention. I am not sure how to proceed Mayor and Council, it's just a simple resolution. It's a notice of intent. Um, of course, if you don't do anything with it, the notice of intent just has to be done 60 days prior to the public hearing. All of these other discussions, like I said, can still happen prior to that. So, thank you. And uh, Madam Mayor, uh, point number three is the written report and cash flow analysis. Stantec uh, will have a draft report. It, might be 200 pages with appendices. That will be on, on the website per statute for the public to review. Um, that expands on the report that was draft from December, Council Member Matthews. So um, it'll have the most up-to-date information within it. That's a very important component of this as well as that report for review. All right, so before we um, discuss and give final direction, I would like to take public comment. So, um, Stephen Poor. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, uh, Councilman Harris. You are the brightest on the tree. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> um, I wanted to bring up a couple of things uh, related to this, and I think it kind of ties in with Council uh, has been talking about what Matthew, Councilwoman Matthews and Harris brought up in particular, and that is some of the key assumptions that go into this, and I'm sure they're, they, they can kick out of their model, what's the net result if you tweak some of these? Or if you go a different way? Or what's behind what they have? And I'd like to just highlight two different numbers, uh, talk about the population growth, and talk a little bit about cost escalation, uh, and where I've used those numbers over my 30 years plus in the financial industry industry when I forecasted. And I'm not claiming I'm an expert forecasting. I'm, I'm recognizing that forecasting is uh, something that we must do, 
and we're never going to get it right, but we're going to give it our best shot. And that's what I hope uh, that this comes to. Maybe the meeting will help. Real quick. So over the last, uh, if you look at the Arizona Regional Economic Analysis Project, and I brought this to the council's attention. We talked about NAU and 480. For the last four or five decades, the growth in Flagstaff for every 10 years is laddered down. In the 90s, 1.9. The first 10 years of this century, 1.5. The last 10 years, 0.9. That's your MSA, not the city. We can talk about the differences. I would suggest, given that we've got a little housing issue, a land constraint, that you're gonna grow slower than the rest of the MSA that has a lot more land than you do. So let's go into this. The staff comes up and says, okay, let's project 1.4%, okay? Now, why does that matter? Well, last November 29th, you employed a consultant to give you a report on a lot of things with regards to the economics of this town. And one of the things they talked about was the population growth. And they suggested it's not going to grow 1.4. It hasn't grown 1.4 for 25 years, for God's sake. And it's going slower. Uh, what they projected is going to grow like 0.75%. And after in 2040, you're going to shrink. That's the consultants in the meeting you all sat at, okay? Not Steve's. Now, why is that important? By 2040, you're at 89,000, 90,000 people. And by 2051, if you grow at 1.4, then you've got to go build that pipeline from uh, Red Gap. You're never going to need Red Gap if we're right at 0.079. And why is that? So what's behind those numbers? Fidelity, the fertility rate in this country has been declining for decades. You're at 1.79, you need 2.1 to have, uh, have population growth. I asked, your, uh, I asked for a, couple, a minute or two. I have a question about um, your calculations about um, population growth and what and what we're seeing nationwide, and how it impact, how it um, is reflected in Flagstaff. Sure. When I looked at these numbers back for any uh, for NAH 480, uh, I took a look at for these last five decades, and the population by this group was, gave the the country, and the country grew at a rate. Arizona grew at a rate, a eh, couple percentages higher. Okay, not 10, a couple of percentages higher. Don't remember off the top of my head. And, and, and Flagstaff grew a little bit in any given decade faster or slower than Arizona during the last 50 years, okay? And, the, and if you get closer to this time frame, those numbers can come very close to each other. That is, the growth of Arizona is very close to Flagstaff for some of the reasons we all know with regards to we don't have housing for people here, and we're now one of the costliest zip, zip codes in the state. And people can go live in the valley a lot cheaper. And there's a lot of places that they could go live outside the valley that's going to be a lot cheaper than Flagstaff. So I, th that's the answer to those numbers. You can go back to your presentation from, I think it was Pollock who gave you that presentation on 1129, and they got their numbers. And I'd just like to say those numbers, and most numbers you should ask about, are driven by the, fidel the fertility rate, which I heard last month is now 1.6. You need the fertility rate, the deaths. We predict deaths pretty good here. In the, this, that, that's not difficult. Wild cards immigration, but th that's driving population. We're barely growing as a country. We're projected in the future not to grow that much at all as a country. And what's going to come here, given the cost of living, I don't know. But I, I would suggest the 1.4 that feeds into the Red Gap Ranch pipeline at $160 million looks like that's not going to happen in 2050 if you adjust those numbers. But put it through the model and see what happens. The other, so their growth at 1% account growth here Remember, that's account growth, households, right? We're talking about population. Two people per household, maybe? I don't know what the exact number is in Flagstaff. We'll give that a shot, though. So you're not talking about 1.4. You're not talking about 1%. You're talking about half of 0.7. You're talking about 3.75 account growth. Just on the residential side, and I know you've got commercial and other things. That's going to grow slower, too. But anyway, just FYI. Last thing I'll, I'll mention, the inflation factors here. You got three and a half percent. 
You got utilities at 6%. You got CPIs adjusted at 4%. So there's something called Treasury Indexed Inflation Bonds, 10 years. They trade in the open market. You would look at those against the fixed rate of 10-year treasuries. The difference is what the market's assuming inflation's going to be for the next 10 years. What's it been since inflation took off in 21? Between 2 and 2 and a point four. Is it 2.4 today, guys? Not 3.5, not 7, not 6, not 4. 2. Point four. And I think if you throw some of these numbers in there, here's the downside, here's the upside, come up, to, come up with the rationale why some of these things are going to grow faster. I could come up with some why utilities are going to grow faster. Um, okay. But I'm just pointing out there's some numbers out there at the market that can help you and guide you. And I think it'd be helpful for the community, A, to have that meeting, and B, to have the model outputs. Thank you for my time. Thank you, Mr. Poor. All right, I don't see any additional public comment. So, um, all right, council. I'm hearing that we want to have a work session separate from a council meeting or, or separate from a regular work session with other items on the agenda. Um, and we want to... Um, yeah, the town hall that you're already planning on having, correct? Or? We actually had that event, Mayor. It was uh, a week ago. Yeah, at the East Flag Library. So that's what I was referencing. We could do something similar like that if we wanted to do another separate item. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that I, I'm hearing a consensus that we um, want to redouble our efforts to make sure that the public is understanding what it is that we're talking about here and that they have the opportunity to ask questions or to watch. Was that recorded? So it was a, a round table. So there was basically tables set up in a room where folks could come in. They have a map of who was where. We could do the rate calculator for them, ask questions about operations, maintenance, the capital projects. Um, I think we had four community members in attendance at that point. Erin's um, been doing a lot of tabling, though, where she's also been able to share this information um, and do some calculations. So I'll turn it over to her so she can maybe talk about those experiences as well if you'd like to hear that. So, uh, Mayor, we, yes, we've been tabling. Um, I've been alongside Water Awareness Month. We were at Science Saturday at Willow Bend, and I was at the Aquaplex on Saturday. Uh, we were at uh, Joe Montoya on Wednesday. That was fun. Those guys are hoot and gals. Um, the, mostly the residents I've talked to, they, they understand it. They appreciate the heads up that we're giving them a five-year window of impacts. Um, the only comment card I received was from a senior asking if we'd consider a senior discount. Um, I've probably talked with 20 residents, 20, 25 residents. So um, we'd like to get more participation, but it's not coming. Councilmember Matthews. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and Someone mentioned it earlier, um, the residential, um, there's less number of households that'll be impacted, although families that are doubling up, sharing rooms, um, they will. They will be in the tier that takes more of a brunt of it. But um, I, you know, I, I'm just now hearing the business community is now paying attention, the nonprofits we have, you know, two nonprofits in town that just recently stepped into, you know, multi-unit facilities that haven't considered that. We have hotels, hospitalities. I know that our commercial rates are combined with, I think, our school rates or something. But still, there's that average. There's might be 50 that, you know, are way up here in the 80,000 or 100,000 gallons a month and maybe they haven't thought about paying attention to what that does and I just want to make sure that 
we've reached out to those people and they've done the rate calculator and they can see how it's going to impact their business. Um, and so if we could just have another town hall and it'll be on our shoulders to make sure we've reached out to um, our constituents and get them here to pay attention, that would be lovely. Besides four, because we have 80,000 here. So. We, w we were planning the, the one for April 11th that we punted because we didn't have the rate calculator ready yet. And that was going to be, I think, an online, like what we did back in November, where people can call in. And we're presenting live, and people can be in the venue, I think, as well. So we'll work on that plan, and we'll try to execute that you know, very soon so that it can help inform um, you in advance. Like the chamber, notify them, get them involved, and yeah, we'll send out emails to everyone in every way we can. So, and Erin, you you've presented to the chamber board, haven't you? Uh, actually, Director Jones has uh, multiple times, and we've been on some calls with them. And would you like to comment on your interactions? I think for a clarification, I did have an opportunity to report to the board on one occasion, but we have been engaged with the business advocacy group. Uh, so we presented to them multiple times. Um, I continue to meet with the administration from the chamber who also facilitates that information, and they also bounce questions back, and we try to respond to those um, immediately. So I feel like that's been a pretty constant conversation. Uh, we also had a chance to meet with NAU, and we've messed up with some other local groups um, which I think is a good takeaway too. I feel like while we're trying to get into the community and, and, um, and make that contact, um, we are also available either through the, the clean, um, clean Water Flag website or you can reach us online. But people are reaching out to us. Uh, we're facilitating those conversations um, as, as quick as we can and trying to get their, the answers uh, documented or the questions and answered and try to be attentive to that. Thank you. So, uh, Council Member House. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just wondering, for the calculator um, that's available, has there been tracking on that to see how much it's been utilized or, or gather any data from that? Mayor and Council Member House, we just released it today, so we have only our own data that but we'll, we've had a lot of website traffic since the last time we updated you. Um, I want to say we've had a couple hundred m more uh, visits to the website, and then we can track since we re uh, release information that the calculator is available. All right, so staff will let us know when we can arrange a um, work session you will arrange another town hall um, in, in whatever way works out um, for schedules and, and uh, venues. And council, what we need to do today is, um, is read the resolution if we so choose. And again, this is this is uh, like with the, the um, sorry, I think I'm getting tired and it's only five, um, with the property tax when we have to post that, that we will consider raising the property tax. And we haven't raised it in many years, but we have to post as a, um, as a legal matter. So... Are we willing to read the resolution by title only this evening? Mayor, I'm willing to make a motion. <clears throat> I move that we read resolution number 2024-19 by title only. Thank a you. Second. Aye. Thank you. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, city clerk. A resolution of the Flagstaff City Council adopting a notice of intention to increase water services rates or rate components, fees, or service charges and setting a public hearing date on June 18th, 2024. Thank you. Can I get a motion to adopt? Adopt resolution number 2024-19. Thank you. Can I get a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
All right, adopted. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I might, Mayor, just one last thing. The next step slide on here will revise because we're talking about the same topic this Thursday with the Water Commission, and they might be interested in the same types of scenarios. But um, the Friday is when we'll be have releasing the draft report of the full study in draft form only. And then we'll work with you, we'll work with scheduling that work session in these next few weeks. But thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And thank you, Council, for your um, thoughtful recommendations and questions. Uh, so I've had a request to take a break. So let's take a 10 minute break and then we will finish up with the last cap update. All right, we are ready to get started. 10A, land availability and suitability study and code analysis project, just rolls off the tongue. Um, <laughs> looking forward to this presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members. Um, I'm here with our internal project team, um, Tiffany Antol, Genevieve Parathri, Jennifer Michelson, and Jessica Watson. And we also have our consultant team online who will be doing the majority of the presentation. Um, just quickly, we're gonna go over, these are the things we're gonna go over um, in today's presentation. But I just kind of wanna give a reminder about this project. The Land Availability and Suitability Study, or the LAS, is a snapshot um, of a point in time. And this is a data document that is informing the code analysis project. The code analysis project is broken out into three steps, with each step going to our, inter our internal steering committee, board and commissions, and council before moving on to the next. And right now, we're at step one with the code diagnosis. Diagnosis. We're all trying to practice saying that word correctly. Um, so the land availability, suitability, and the code diagnosis that we're presenting today are both fact-finding documents that will build the base for the next two steps of the CAP, which are developing concept recommendations for changes um, to code and process. And then the last step, which is code recommendations and impact report, which will dive deeper into how proposed changes will move the needle on achieving sustainability impacts and the co-benefits of housing, affordability, and supply. Um, just to kind of set the tone for what you're hearing today and to also remind you that you're gonna continue to see us. So just another reminder that this is a very collaborative process. It's a multi-pronged initiative to address critical long-term planning and resilience needs. It's a financial and an actual participant par partnership between planning, housing, sustainability and mountain line. Um, and mountain line will become much more of a, of a component as we talk about proposed code changes. Um, but this is also providing just a very high level opportunity for various divisions and sections at the city to have much needed coordination conversations. Again, the project scope is two part, the land availability suitability, which is what land is available for development and its development potential and barriers. We are gonna to present tonight both publicly owned and privately owned lands. We're by no means saying that um, we're giving any, um, we're not suggesting that there's gonna be development on the privately owned lands. It's just really an inventory of what lands met a certain technical threshold to be determined that they might be ripe for redevelopment or development, but we want to be clear that we're not suggesting that we're doing anything with anybody's privately owned lands. Um, and then the code analysis project, which is an in-depth analysis of our codes and processes through the, the city council's lens of commitments to addressing housing and climate. And we're also looking at what's working as well as what's not, because we know that our code has all of our codes have a lot of great stuff in them, and we don't want to lose that. So we are trying to make sure that we're aware of those things so that we don't make changes that go against things that are already working. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our consultant team uh, for the, the presentation. Thank you, Michelle. 
Uh, good to see everyone virtually, at least here. My name is Reed Stapleton, and I'm the project manager for the Last Cap team. And I will give a brief overview of the land availability and site suitability findings. And then I'll hand things over to Jamin Kimmel from Cascadia Partners, who will give the bulk of the presentation on our preliminary uh, findings about the code and, and um, where there could be some opportunities to advance uh, the city's climate and housing uh, policy goals. Uh, next slide, please. So just a real quick overview and, and recap on the goals of the of land availability, availability and site suitability uh, analysis. Um, first of all, as, as everyone knows, there's limited land left to develop, many, need, many needs for those lands. And we wanted to under, better understand specifically where are the vacant sites and what's the, what are the characteristics of those. And what that is, is lending towards with our overall project is a better understanding of where are the zoned lands that have capacity for residential development so that we can make sure that that, that code analysis is really focused specifically on those sites uh, where there's the greatest potential for residential development. Uh, at the same time, it, it provides data points that are useful in the regional planning process to understand uh, how do these vacant lands potentially fold into uh, comprehensive plan and zoning designations that are being considered with the regional plan. So it's a, a pretty fortuitous dovetailing of, of issues uh, coming together that it helps inform. Next slide, please. So our, our broad analysis when it comes to the land availability study has really been about uh, GIS, first of all, and then taking a more clinical and more uh, qualitative look at the data points and looking at where are their environmental constraints, where are their other um, property characteristics that would further reduce down available land. And from there, we, we created an inventory of vacant and underutilized sites. Once we had that popu population of vacant and underutilized sites, then we worked with a stakeholder team at the city to identify specifically where are their what we called opportunity sites or uh, properties that really have the potential to move the needle when it comes to uh, the city's housing and climate goals. Next slide, please. So what we found from that land availability study was that there are about 7,000 acres of vacant land that are unencumbered by environmental constraints based on our, our broad strokes analysis. Um, of those environmental constraints, steep slopes was by far the, uh, the most dominant environmental constraint that, that further reduced down the vacant land. Um, about 6,700 acres of that vacant land are, are residentially zoned, uh, so that the, there's a significant amount of, of residentially zoned land, uh, you know, a, a greater proportion of the vacant land is residentially zoned, although we did look at commercial and, and a little bit of industrial land and public land as well. Um, of the underutilized land, about 4,800 acres were determined to be unencumbered by environmental constraints. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we, we took that overall population of vacant and underutilized sites and worked with a stakeholder team at the city to identify where are there uh, roughly the top 50 sort of opportunity sites of where there's potential for development you can um, or, or for moving the needle when it comes to um, the, the city's climate goals and housing production goals. Uh, you can see to the right were sites identified in the downtown area, and then to the left, you can see the sites that some of the larger tracks that were located more on the periphery of the, of the city limits in the study area. Next slide, please. So some, some key conclusions that came from this process. One is that 36 of those, of those 51 opportunity sites are commercially zoned. And you'll hear, you'll hear Jamin speak to this somewhat in, in his presentation, but um, that caused us to really want to take a, a look at the commercial zone uh, development standards to make sure that those are, um, are factored in when we look at, at potential adjustments to the code that can better accommodate housing uh, and housing affordability. Uh, some of the more significant tracks Nine, nine of the sites totaling about 2,500 acres are zoned rural or estate residential. That allows a zoning or that allows a density of about one unit to the acre. 
Um, so obviously for those sites to urbanize, rezones would be, uh, would be required. Also, there's, there's significant infrastructure deficiencies by and large to many of those sites, which really elevates the, the need and necessity um, if, if those are, are to be realized for housing to, to really focus and prioritize on, on uh, infrastructure network planning for those, for those sites. Um, so those are some broad strokes conclusions from that analysis. And with that, I will hand things over to Jamin and he'll talk a little bit how this has transitioned into the code diagnosis. Great, thanks Reed. Uh, so I'm Jamin Kimmel. Um, good to be back with you, Council and, uh, and Mayor tonight. Um, so I'm with Cascadia Partners. Our uh, role on the project is to do um, most of the analysis, primarily focusing on the zoning and subdivision standards in the code. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm going to focus my presentation uh, mainly on that parts of the code, and then we'll also touch on um, some, some code issues we've identified in the uh, engineering and building code standards. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, before we get to that, I, I want to do a just a quick uh, overview of um, how we approach this project. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So just kind of to restate our understanding of the purpose uh, of the project. So. We know the city has adopted both um, housing and climate emergencies, uh, and these call for bold and urgent action on these issues. Um, they're truly emergencies. And there's a recognition that the city's codes are part of the problem, and for a, maybe for a variety of reasons, um, but the city's not sure which specific um, code provisions are most problematic, and to what extent the codes are a barrier to housing and climate action. And so we're tasked with answering this question of what specific code provisions are getting in the way and what are the most important kinds of code changes that are needed to make sure that you, uh, that the city can make progress on these housing and climate goals. Next slide. So this is a relatively complex task um, to do this as we're looking at um, a variety of different kinds of codes and looking at from these two um, lenses, which are, are complex issues in themselves. And so that's why we divided this process up into three phases, as uh, Michelle mentioned. Uh, we are just in this first phase uh, tonight, really diagnosing the problems in the code, trying to kind of really define the scope and the nature of the issues. Um, and so next we'll turn to developing some kind of conceptual solutions. Um, so the kinds of code changes that may um, be effective testing those and then refining them into specific recommendations. Um, before we did that though, we wanna really make sure you have a chance to um, get informed on what we see are the code key issues in the code and to um, weigh in with you know, your experience, you know, living, working um, and reviewing development applications in Flagstaff. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So the city has multiple kind of plans um, that document their goals and policies um, related to um, housing and climate. And so one of our first steps um, was to try to get a handle on what are all the dimensions um, of the housing and climate goals. Um, those are two big issues and there's different parts uh, of each of those. And so in order to do that, we kind of synthesized uh, all the various uh, goals that were across these plans. Uh, and identified a set of key outcomes. And so that's what you see listed here. There's a lot of them. Um, we thought this was an important step because it helped us to be able to um, uh, provide an evaluation of for each code uh, provision that we find to either be a barrier to housing or climate. We can say, well, what specific housing outcome or climate outcome is this code provision a barrier to? Uh, and really, zoning, honing in on what, what's the key housing um, outcome that um, might be um, improved if we um, modify this part of the code. Uh, so you'll see that in the, in the report um, and there's a detailed analysis for each code provision of which of those outcomes are impacted. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, this um, scope of this code analysis is um, comprehensive, so it includes all regulations that affect uh, development in um, Flagstaff, and that includes um, all the relevant 
uh, titles in the municipal code, including both the zoning and subdivision code, but also engineering standards, uh, building and fire code, uh, and the um, technical design manuals that uh, accompany those parts of the code. And so um, that's why you see as, as you have a planning firm here uh, in Cascadia and we're tasked with the zoning and subdivision codes. Uh, we also have Dow looking at engineering standards and GBD an architecture firm helping with the building code. Uh, so that's their, their role to uh, make sure we're thinking through uh, and considering all the different uh, kinds of regulations that affect development. Next slide. So how do we approach this work generally? Uh, and so um, after kind of a close review of all uh, of the city's codes, we interviewed both city staff and members of the development community. Uh, so we had a several focus groups um, that included um, uh, developers who are primarily building housing in the community today. We reviewed some permit files from some of the more complex development projects that helps us to get a really insight into kind of the kinds of code issues that are coming up um, in the uh, development review process. And then lastly, you, as you'll see in this presentation, we use some uh, building and financial uh, modeling tools to try to more closely analyze some issues. Uh, and so you'll see in this presentation, some of those 3D models and financials um, that come out of that, that not only help to kind of illustrate these issues, but quantify them and help you, uh, will help us as we go further in uh, testing whether or not changes in the code would actually move the needle on the, on the things we care about related to housing and climate. Okay, go ahead to the next slide. So I'll go ahead and now turn to summarizing uh, our findings from the code diagnostic. And I'm gonna start with the zoning and subdivision codes, and then I'll pass it on to uh, Reed to cover the engineering uh, section, and um, Mark from GBD who will cover the building codes. Next slide. So some, some context setting before where we dive into the zoning and subdivision code. Um, so as um, Reed mentioned, the uh, work on the last analysis um, was very useful for us to understand where is it most important to focus our analysis and you know, answering that question of um, where in particular is most new housing and new development likely to occur in the city. Um, and the last was really helpful in answering this. Uh, and so most of the city's buildable land uh, is in the rural residential and estate residential uh, zone districts today. And as larger uh, developments and subdivisions uh, occur uh, in those um, areas, historically those have been rezoned to another zone that allows for um, higher densities. And so as you'll see in the diagnostic report in this presentation, we focus um, more on the um, uh, single family residential, medium density residential, commercial zones, those zones that are likely uh, to be the kind of receiving zones when properties are rezoned from ER or RR. There's a helpful context is although they're zoned that now, the regional plan is likely to allow many of those properties, many of those sites uh, where there's significant buildable land to be rezoned. Next slide. So we also know um, and wanted to take into account where the regional plan today and as it evolves, as it's being um, developed uh, uh, this year, um, where it would call for uh, new housing to be developed in order to help meet climate and housing goals. And one of the major priorities um, coming out of the regional plan is to encourage infill of housing within um, Flagstaff's existing neighborhoods. And that looks different in different locations, uh, but generally um, there's, um, there are many reasons that infill housing is a good idea and would advance the city's housing and climate goals. And so for that reason, we looked closely at the commercial zones uh, in particular, which have historically actually had a lot of housing development in them. And then also those medium density and high density residential zones uh, as we uh, believe that's where the bulk of this infill housing uh, will occur. Go to the next slide. Um, we also know that the regional, rec the regional plan recognizes that new housing um, must also occur in order to meet your um, housing needs in the future. Um, new housing must also occur in some of those areas 
that are zoned estate residential or rural residential today, more on the periphery of the city, what we might call greenfield uh, development. And so uh, we're asking really two questions of the code when we're thinking about new housing in those areas is, first is how well is the zoning, rezoning and subdivision process working to facilitate housing uh, production? And then when rezoning is, occurs, how can we be sure that the new development uh, that's subject to those uh, new zoning standards will advance your housing and climate goals. So again, why we're focusing on um, some of those zones, while they don't have a lot of buildable land today, are likely to um, be the subject of rezonings. Okay, go to the next slide. So one thing we, we always like to ask in a project like this is, you know, what happens if housing production doesn't keep pace with demand? And in most places, this means that lower income folks in the community are more likely to be displaced from their neighborhood or even displaced from the city in general. As prices rise, um, housing production can't keep up with demand, uh, supply is constrained, and um, those are the kinds of folks that usually aren't able to stay and withstand um, those market pressures. And so as part of this project, we studied where um, the communities in Flagstaff are that may be more vulnerable to what we would call displacement. And um, so that's what this map shows here is the outcome of that analysis showing uh, areas where there are greater populations that be vulnerable to residential displacement. And so um, it's important to keep in mind that the research on displacement uh, points to two key findings. And one is that housing production actually helps to mitigate displacement. And so more housing supply tends to flatten housing prices and reduce uh, that pressure uh, that would lead to displacement. However, that housing must be produced across the city. If it's limited to areas only where the households are vulnerable to displacement and localized to those neighborhoods, then it could actually make displacement worse. And so if you go to the next slide, with that in mind, um, we looked at where do those displacement vulnerable communities, what kinds of zone districts um, are currently mapped there and what might th that might tell us about where we might focus some uh, analysis and think about the kinds of changes that would make sure that they're housing opportunities in all zones. And in Flagstaff, many of those neighborhoods that are um, vulnerable are mapped to those higher density residential and commercial zones. There's sort of a word of caution there that we would like to support infill development in those zones, but if those are the only places where housing development is occurring, that is what's more likely to um, lead to more of those households being displaced and not having somewhere else uh, to land. And so we're focusing on both those higher density uh, and commercial zones, but also the kind of lower and medium density zones where um, that are more likely to be mapped outside of those neighborhoods or be remapped in, in other areas, uh, rezoned in other areas that aren't as uh, vulnerable to displacement. Okay, that's some context. So if you go to the next slide, um, and we get into some of the key barriers and issues here. And so with that context in mind, um, what are some of those key issues that um, are holding back the city from meeting its housing and climate goals, specifically in the zoning and subdivision uh, codes? And so this is a kind of a, a overview slide um, that gives you a snapshot of um, all of the major issues uh, that we have identified in the, in the zoning and subdivision code. See, some of those issues um, are um, somewhat citywide. They apply to most development in most situations. And then there are some that are specific to certain zone districts. And, they're color-coded as we go through this slide deck, you'll um, see um, that those colors are used to kind of relate back to wh which zones or areas are we talking about. Next slide. So I wanna start with um, one of the more um, uh, predominant or common issues that um, applies to a lot of different kinds of housing development. And that is the rezoning and subdivision processes. And so, our finding is that these processes are relatively complex. Um, they're somewhat cumbersome and they might be slowing down the pace of housing production 
or maybe even deterring developers from proposing rezonings. And we think that given where your buildable land is and where you need housing development to occur, uh, it'd be really important that the rezoning process is working efficiently and smoothly uh, to make sure that that um, um, is not a, a barrier to housing development. We see the main issue with the rezoning process is the requirement to secure a development agreement um, prior to approval of a rezoning. This forces developers to commit to a very specific development plan relatively early in the process. Sometimes that plan becomes infeasible after further study um, and causes other complications um, down the road. So we think allowing those kinds of commitments to be made either later in the process or through a different mechanism could provide some better, some much needed kind of flexibility in the process. And there separately, we find there's two issues with the subdivision process. The first is that the conceptual plat phase of the process is probably unnecessary. It's more common to have a two-stage subdivision process and the, uh, the city has a three-stage process. And second, requiring that city council approval at all stages of the subdivision process and for all kinds of subdivisions tends to lengthen the process and increase the perception of uncertainty and risk uh, for developers, which may be deterring some housing development. Okay, next slide. So many zones will be, or many new subdivisions will be rezoned to the um, R1 single family zone. Um, can you, uh, Michelle, yeah, there we go. <laughs> There's multiple parts to this one. Sorry. So um, we're gonna turn to some of the zone kind of specific standards that we've, we've found to be um, a challenge in this single family residential zone. So uh, this zone allows densities up to six units per acre. And on paper, this is a kind of a reasonable density level for a single family subdivision. Um, in reality, there are other regulations that prevent developers from actually reaching that density level. And so it's not really possible to maximize uh, the density according um, while meeting other standards. And so the two main kind of culprits there limiting density are minimum street width, uh, which Reed, I think we'll uh, discuss a little more detail in the minimum lot size of 6,000 square feet. Go to the next slide. So these constraints on uh, density are important because it actually directly affects um, housing affordability. So this level of density and generally lower density usually results in less affordable housing for a couple of reasons. One is that there are higher land costs per unit. So the cost of land must be spread across fewer homes, which generally re means raising the, the minimum price that's needed for each home. And then secondly, um, it also tends to encourage larger unit sizes. So if each home has to absorb more land costs, developers are more likely to increase the size of the units to make them more um, marketable to higher income buyers. And so our modeling found that in the R1 zone today at this density level, a typical 2000 square foot home must sell for about $940,000 in order for that to be economically vi viable as a project for a housing developer. So you need to earn about 275% of the median income in, in the Flagstaff uh, to afford that. So it's clear that's, that's out of reach for most families or most households in, in Flagstaff. So the question is what kinds of changes could be made to uh, help um, allow some, um, some higher densities that could chip away at some of those costs, make it a, um, a little bit um, easier to build for um, moderate income households in this zone district. The zone district does allow some um, alternative housing types kind of on two single family detached homes, um, at least uh, kind of on paper. Um, but the, those uh, allowances are relatively um, restrictive and sort of narrow. Um, and we think they're actually discouraging developers from building anything but detached single family homes. So taking a look at how, how the definitions of housing types and what kinds of housing types are allowed is, is, um, would be beneficial. Next slide. And then more looking at the climate angle, um, there's a question of um, even if that density of six units per acre is achieved, that density falls well below what would support a multimodal transportation system. And so the research has found that a minimum density needed for transit service to be economically viable is somewhere in the range of eight to 15 units per acre. Uh, and this happens to also be the density level that is 
needed to kind of a minimum density to support walkable uh, neighborhood retail uh, businesses. And so to support more sustainable transportation options, it would also make sense um, for the R1 zone to allow some slightly higher densities. Next slide. So turning now to the medium density zone, um, unlike the R1 zone, the, the stated intent of this zone is to encourage a wider variety of housing types, including apartments or condos. Um, the maximum densities of the zone is 14 units an acre, um, but that's the main barrier to um, apartments or condos being built in this zone. So the model on the left here shows what you'd have with a condo project with about 900 square foot units. It's a relatively inefficient use of the site um, and unlikely to be built. The project that's more likely to build is the one on the right, um, which has 1600 square foot townhomes. Uh, this project is likely to be much more profitable than the one on the left. So if the city wants to encourage some smaller and affordable units in this MR zone, it would also make sense to look at that maximum density regulation. And I should clarify that doesn't necessarily mean that um, the uh, code needs to allow taller buildings or more lot coverage or reduce setbacks. Uh, it's really just strictly that units per acre um, that is the major barrier to um, smaller and more affordable units. Okay, let's go to the resource protection overlay zone. Next slide. So many housing developments in the res those residential zones are also subject to the resource protection overlay zone. Um, this is um, a zone that applies to in areas that have uh, existing forests, slopes, or uh, floodplains. It generally requires about 30 to 40 percent of the resources on the site, uh, those natural resources, to be preserved. And so there's an inherent trade-off here is that um, that is a significant amount of area that can't be developed with housing. Um, there's important um, values in preserving some of those resources, um, but we wanted to point out that there is a trade-off there. And because such a high amount of those resources must be preserved, there's also been ob observations that developers are choosing to kind of squeeze in homes um, very close to and next to existing uh, mature trees, um, which um, has the actual kind of consequence of potentially increasing the risk of an exposure to wildfire hazard. Next slide. So this level of just preservation on its own is not so much of a, a, a challenge, but we actually think it's combined with um, another regulation that um, makes the RPO um, uh, a, a significant barrier to housing production. And that is that the zone limits density below the base zone um, in addition to requiring those preservation areas. And so in the MR zone, for example, um, uh, if you were in the resource protection overlay, you not only have to set aside the preserved areas, but then in the developed areas, uh, you must build at a lower density and build fewer units. Uh, we think that's un unnecessary to do both of those things at the same time, potentially. Next slide. So turning to the commercial zones, these are areas where the city has supported high density housing in the past. Um, however, in um, as part of the high density housing changes in 2021, a conditional um, use permit was now um, is now required for any project that exceeds a density of 29 units an acre. So we'll talk about that conditional use permit um, shortly, but that is a major barrier. It limits the um, essentially uh, a project that would not apply for a CUP be limited to this kind of model that you're seeing here, which is a two-story building where most of the ground floor needs to be in commercial space. This is just a, a project that's simply not economically feasible in a commercial zone. Uh, land costs are high in these zones and more units are really necessary for these kinds of projects to be viable. The next slide. So turning to parking requirements. So in these commercial zones that allow relatively high density, if the developer was to apply for a CUP and build at that higher density, one of the things that they would run into is that the city's minimum parking requirements are a significant barrier to building more affordably and more sustainably. And so the standards require effectively, if you're building in a relatively high density, um, standards effectively require that you build a, a multi-level parking garage in order to meet the parking requirements. This is a very expensive uh, form of development. Uh, the cost of a parking space and garage costs about um, twenty to $40,000 and those costs are passed on into higher into higher rents. 
On the climate side, the, the concrete and parking structures is one of the more co uh, carbon intensive building materials. And so there's higher GHG emissions um, associated with this form of development. And there has been some research that found that the high amount of on-site parking tends to actually encourage people to own more vehicles and drive more frequently. And so there's also a, a nexus here with your um, transportation related greenhouse gas emissions. So implication here is not the city needs to eliminate any of their minimum parking requirements. It's, we just think they're set at a level that's not consistent with allowing uh, some encouraging some high density housing, um, especially where it is um, served by transit. Next slide. So I mentioned the high, high capacity housing regulations that were passed in 2021, I believe. And the main um, barrier we found related to those is actually the, the requirement for a conditional use permit. Uh, conditional use permit is a major source of risk for a developer, introduces uncertainty about what kinds of conditions might be required or whether the project would be approved, uh, and that can add significant costs to the development. Separately from that, there's also some other regulations in the high capacity housing uh, standards that um, add some complexity and costs that we think may be unnecessary and there are other uh, ways to achieve uh, similar ends. Turn next slide. So turning now to the city's incentive program. So unlike everything we've discussed so far, these are voluntary programs. And so it's really important that the incentives are uh, attractive for a developer to use, otherwise they won't be used. And our modeling has found that projects that use specifically the affordable housing incentives would generally be less profitable than projects that did not, uh, despite that the higher densities that are allowed by the incentives. And so the, the costs of providing those affordable units um, uh, outweigh the benefits. And so um, a higher density bonus may work, um, but I think this is something we'd like to examine further and see if those incentives can kind of be recalibrated to be more attractive. Next slide. And then there's the sustainability incentives, which uh, faces some kind of a similar issue. Um, for a variety of reasons, developers are somewhat hesitant to meet some of those incentives, and particularly the um, requirement to build all electric buildings. And the current incentive provides a density bonus of 25%. We believe that may be too low in order to be compelling to most private developers. Um, and there's a reason to look more closely at that and see if that can be made uh, more attractive so that more projects um, use those incentives. Next slide. So just wrapping up, we wanna recognize that there's a, um, a number of other policy goals outside of housing and climate that the city has that may be impacted if some of these regulations are changed. And um, those specific policy goals are identified in our report uh, and as we come back to you with concepts and solutions and recommendations, we will be thinking through how do we reconcile some of these other tensions with things like um, management of on-street parking and resource protection, uh, community character. Uh, those will be integrated into our thinking in the next stage of the process. So with that, I'll uh, shift it back over to Reed. Thanks, Shaman. So uh, in addition to all of the uh, zoning code, development code, subdivision code um, provisions that, that Jamin's team looked through, Dow has done a review of the engineering and transportation impact standards and, and fire access standards. And I'll briefly run through that before I hand things over to Mark Raggett, who will talk about the um, building related codes. Uh, next slide, please. So um, one of the one of the first things that we did in, in conducting our analysis was we convened a development stakeholder team of engineers, architects, developers, uh, and others involved in the development industry locally and um, gathered information from them and, and used that as a part of our, our research. And um, some things that came up from that process were um, some concerns about the water and sewer impact analysis process and the transportation impact analysis process and that perhaps in certain instances in, um, for example, the case of, of rezones, that the requirement to really drill in on a detailed development plan and, and spend a significant amount of cost on, on consultant fees and, and working through a, a development program uh, might be premature in the development process, particularly if the outcome of that rezone request is, is uncertain. 
Um, and so that that was something that, that was identified as a, a area to be looked at with this next round of, of uh, consideration. Um, we heard a number of comments about a concern that there's an over-reliance on individual projects to fund transportation infrastructure um, versus maybe a, a process by which there's a, a development program that's funded through impact fees um, and, and some desire to potentially look at, at a, a model like that. We also heard some concerns about in certain instances where the context would warrant it, uh, shrinking down the cross sections of roads and that there have been some challenges in, in obtaining city approvals for those types of modifications. Next slide, please. So with the water and sewer impact analysis process, what we heard was it's, it's um, you know, a costly process and that in um, certain instances, in particular areas of downtown, uh, the fact that you have aging infrastructure and um, infrastructure that's that's already maybe challenged just simply uh, due to to the the age of the of the network that that could pretend, potentially discourage infill development if if individual sites are, are required to make those more extensive upgrades um, this is also a little bit more in the weeds but our infrastructure our, our engineering team identified that in a couple of instances that the uh, water and sewer demand metrics in the city's code are from uh, 1980, might be a little overly conservative based on actual use and might warrant a, a closer look. Next slide, please. Regarding transportation access, we identified a handful of items that, that warrant some uh, consideration. Uh, street cross sections are required in, in, in different instances. There, there are different codes that apply, and so it can be somewhat complex to determine which, uh, which section applies, and uh, sometimes they can be highly, highly prescriptive with, without a lot of flexibility to modify through the, um, through the modification process. The winter parking ordinance, um, it, it, because those parking stalls that are required in the street section can't be relied upon for a, a significant uh, portion of the year, um, it, it, it requires with the off-street parking, re off parking requirements that developments provide more off-street parking because you can't rely on that on-street parking. So um, that's something that, that we've talked about and I think we want to look at a little bit further is, is that the winter parking ordinance and the impacts on potentially driving more off-street parking and more of that on-site cost that Jamin was speaking to. Um, the, the codes tend to lean towards um, a fair, fairly significant use of cul-de-sacs, which can be inefficient and uh, be more land consumptive. We also identified some instances where setbacks on alleys actually result in a, a less compact urban form and maybe some opportunities to, to change those, those setback requirements. And then lastly, the, the driveway standards for some multifamily development are the same as commercial development, which might not be most appropriate, particularly in, in some of the smaller three to four unit projects and might warrant a closer look. Next slide, please. And then lastly, as I mentioned on the, on the first slide, when it comes to the transportation impact analysis requirements, um, there was some at least anecdotal information that we heard from the developers about uh, scaling back in certain instances the, their projects to avoid the traffic impact analysis thresholds and, and therefore potentially um, not trigger offsite improvements, which obviously is not furthering the, the goals of housing production. Um, and, and then on that note, there was a, a concern about potential equity where with the idea that some of the larger projects are triggering the traffic impact analyses and triggering the offsite improvements, that the smaller projects that aren't triggering those same thresholds uh, may be avoiding their relative share of, of what the, uh, the transportation improvements should be. Again, speaking to the possible notion of a, of a traffic impact fee program in which each unit would pay a per unit fee that would go towards a uh, off-site uh, collective infrastructure plan. So uh, those are things that we heard, things that we'll be looking at a little bit further as we get a little deeper in the process. And with that, I'll hand things over to Mark. Uh, thanks, Reed. 
and Mark Raggett with GBD Architects. And next slide, I think. I don't think I have too many. I think this is my slides. So just to run through this, and this is going to build on what you've already heard from Jamin and Reed. But just quickly on some of the key findings. Uh, the first one is that the building codes are kind of sort of at a level where they're not really um, contributing dramatically to that increased construction cost. They're much sort of broader, bigger forces at work there that are increasing costs and reducing affordability. Most notably, um, just current labor sort of issues and requirements, supply chain disruptions, which have sort of been uh, you know current set of issues, the cost of, uh, of materials in general, higher financing costs, just the cost of money itself, and frankly, increased demand like we heard in Flagstaff. So all those all those factors are sort of pushing the cost of construction for affordable housing up a lot faster than the building codes themselves. We took a look at adaptive reuse, which is sort of a great thing to do to kind of think about a more sustainable development pattern. Each of those, there aren't really, each of those is sort of a highly unique sort of condition when you're taking an existing structure and trying to repurpose it or reuse it for a different use like residential. Uh, so there's very, very specific and very localized issues with that. It's very hard to make a sort of broad generalization about sort of issues sort of for or against adaptive reuse. You know, one, pro one adaptive reuse project can trigger a whole sort of host of issues ranging from parking to plumbing to electrical systems to mechanical air movement, all those kinds of things. Um, on sustainability, I think you've already heard from Jamin and Reed that uh, especially through our, our uh, development stakeholder sort of interviews, there appears to be some misalignment between sort of the city goals and aspirations and sort of what how sustainability is seen in the community. Uh, most notably, it's, it's seen as sort of a nice to have and not a need to have. Um, it also appears to sort of, I think the perception is adds a lot of cost, which again could be transferred on to sort of a potential home buyer or sort of a renter. Um, and so I think I think this sort of key finding there is that more more education sort of is needed to get out there and sort of sort of on those different costs and benefits, the pros and cons of sustainable strategies. Carbon neutrality, again, I think there's sort of a the the biggest sort of wins there could be through um, increased requirements for energy and water usage. So again, requirements for uh, higher performance light fixtures, luminaires, as well as looking at water fixtures and low flow toilets, low flow sort of shower heads, et cetera. Uh, definitely thinking about sort of solar readiness and thinking about uh, solar flagstaff being able to take advantage of that sun and thinking about opportunities there. So really focusing on renewable energies to kind of move the needle in terms of carbon neutrality. Um, and finally, I would just say on the sustainable incentives and Jamin sort of did a better job in more detail of talking about this, the incentives are not sort of attractive enough um, to kind of overcome the financial barriers of just building that sustainable system or putting in increased EV charging, et cetera. So there's not enough, you're not getting enough. The carrot isn't sweet enough to sort of attract the developers to put put the infrastructure in as it were right now. And that may require sort of a, a larger look outside of Flagstaff to kind of the state and region and county to kind of see what opportunities there may be to kind of get more alignment on, these, on those incentives and make them more attractive. Right, that may be my only slide. Thank you all. Um, so I'm going to take over from here. And so it's next steps, but as part of that, I'm going to talk about kind of where we've been. Um, and when we started the roadshow, these were kind of the next steps, but we had our internal steering committee, um, one that just talked about the, the land availability suitability, and another on the code diagnosis. We met with the Sustainability Commission, Housing and Transportation Commissions. Um, we had planned on being at planning and zoning last week, um, but the meeting was canceled, so we'll be there next week. And then we're here tonight. Um, so right now, these um, both of these reports are in draft form. We're taking all the feedback that we get um, and really wanting to understand, did we identify the barriers that people who really are um, focused on these fields, is this what they're experiencing as well? Did we miss anything? Did they have anything to add? Um, so we'll be collecting that feedback until middle of next week, and then we'll be uh, consolidating all of that into the final reports. And then it's kind of like wash and, uh, wash and rinse and repeat, and we'll be back here kind of doing the same, um, the same outreach as we move forward to the code concepts and then the code recommendations. Originally, we were going to try to get to council with um, draft code concepts prior to when you went on break. Just having the conversation about um, issues in the code was really challenging, and we haven't even got to the good stuff. And so um, I think we are strategizing on a different type of update that we can bring you before you come to council. And then, I'm sorry, before you go on break, and then we'll be here when you get back from break with that draft concepts to really start to get your feedback on, is this acceptable? Are we addressing the right things? Um, 
And then again, it's gonna be an iterative process with a lot of feedback from our, our technical advisory boards. And now, that concludes our presentation and open to any questions, thank you. Council, questions, comments? Councilmember House. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, this was very interesting to me and especially coming from a background in housing, hearing how um, these different codes and, and zoning um, implications might impact our goals when it comes to both sustainability and housing is very interesting and, and reinforces a lot of what um, I think is known and also gives us a, a different lens into um, better understanding some of those things. So this was very helpful. Um, Especially in terms of the discussion around single family residential zoning, I think there's a lot of possibilities there in terms of shifts that could be made um, to benefit both of the, the um, major plans that we have surrounding housing and um, carbon neutrality and sustainability. Um, so really appreciate that that was highlighted alongside the conversation about displacement and gentrification. Um, I think those are two really important things. Um, a couple questions that came up for me in terms of sustainability and that conversation, I'm wondering what thoughts are about um, how to educate and incentivize sustainability in existing development alongside um, new development and, and new um, opportunities there because I, I think back to the point that was made about um, the equity focus and while we're seeing that there's not um, a lot of good incentive for um, new developers to include some of those sustainable uh, elements. I think there's also a missed opportunity in not showing the benefits of some of that adaptation and, and building that into what's already within our community to show the benefits there to adopting some sustainability efforts um, in terms of cost of management or um, maintaining those buildings or, and things like that. So are there thoughts that you have right now um, or that will be part of the study maybe going into the future that, that focus on that sort of shift? Consultant team, I'm gonna let sure, you take can, the lead. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I can take a, a stab at that. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think, um, you know, when you think about um, the, the electrification of buildings, energy efficiency upgrades, uh, and things like that. Um, the code is a good tool um, when um, a project is being proposed, um, right? So if, a, if they're coming in and they're saying, we wanna do this renovation or an addition, or we're gonna do redevelopment. And then um, at that point, they need to meet some code standards and the city um, has um, the ability to provide um, some, uh, regulatory incentive, right? So to say, well, if you do this in this in sustainability sense, then we'll, we'll allow you to build a few more units than we would otherwise, right? So there's a carrot there available. Um, I think um, in the case of an existing uh, building and trying to spur that renovation to um, happen or that improvement to happen, the code's just probably not a very good tool for doing that um, because it really isn't triggered until someone actually proposes uh, you know, a project. Uh, and so um, I think there are plenty of other tools that are out there. Um, I don't think that we'll cover them uh, in this project um, and um, uh, give them the, the, the due diligence they, they need of um, what tools the city already has and what changes they may make to um, uh, try to make that kind of sustainability um, improvement happen more uh, widely. Um, so it's something that I think is, is probably better suited for thinking about things like um, financial um, incentives or programs, or uh, I know that there's plenty out there in terms of um, uh, low interest loan programs for um, sustainable home renovations. So, so those kind of things are kind of outside the scope of, um, of the development code. Thank you for that. Um, and then my other question was just around, um, it was mentioned that you were engaging with 
the um, primarily it sounded like some of the d uh, development or developer stakeholders in this process and I'm wondering about um, opportunities that you've had or may have into the future with um, engaging with current or existing um, providers and uh, in particular neighborhood associations that um, really kind of highlight for you what is what the existing barriers are within some of the communities themselves from the perspective of the um, residents as well and um, seeing how some of these recommendations may impact those neighborhoods in particular. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. And I, Michelle, unless you wanted to tackle that, I'm happy. I'm happy to. We um, we have Renee Redday, who I think might be in the uh, audience there. I know she was at least going to be tracking this hearing. Uh, Renee Redday from Building Community Flagstaff is on our team, and we do have as a component of our work effort uh, a public engagement plan that will do exactly that. And we're anticipating that that will kick off mid summer. Um, as, as we have a little bit more meat to the, the diagnosis and begin to sort of conceptualize what some of these diagnostic findings might, might mean. Um, so we, we do plan to do exactly that. And I, it's a, I'm, I'm really glad you said that and, and brought that up. Thank you. Additional questions? Yes, Council Member McCarthy. Well, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, there may be some areas where we get some pushback, and we need to take that with a grain of salt. Just, for instance, builders tend to be more interested in the short-term goal of how much money they make and how much the house can be sold for. Uh, but we need to also take into account the long-term uh, cost of ownership or of running the house, so to speak. Just a good example would be that uh, a builder might say, well, I don't want to put in extra insulation because that costs me $300 more. Well, uh, that's true, but it can significantly uh, decrease the cost of ownership. I'll give you an example. In my house, when I build it, and some of you have heard this before, but I'll say it again. <laughs> well, there must be, I think, I don't think Anthony's heard this, so. <laughs> but it only cost me a couple extra hundred dollars to insulate my walls very well and put a little extra in the ceiling. And uh, what's the effect of that? My house has never been hot in the summer because I open a window at the evening and close it in the morning and my house has literally never been hot. Now, almost all of my neighbors have retrofitted their houses with refrigeration units, which cost thousands of dollars. Then they have to operate it. So the point is, by spending a little bit more during the construction, an awful lot of money would save in the long run. So we need to take into account long-term goals and short-term goals. I tend to focus on long-term goals. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. You want to hear that again, Mayor? <laughs> thank you, Council Member. Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. And thank you, Council Member McCarthy. I think my comments paired nicely with yours. And I don't begrudge you retelling that story over and over again. Um, there are always new people that need to hear it. Um, and it's always a relevant part of the conversation that, should, that we should be reminded of. I'm really appreciative of this whole process, of the discussion we've had. Uh, tonight so far, I, I want to thank our consultants for being with us. Uh, I, I think you bring a lot of, uh, clearly a lot of wisdom, knowledge, and gravitas to this. Uh, I, I see that you are taking care of the multifaceted sides of this, uh, this geometric shape uh, that we're dealing with here, and I really do appreciate that. I just, uh, you know, uh, um, I think, I think what I'll say is, is I just want to make sure that through this whole process, we don't end up chasing a ball out into the street. I think that's the way I'd like to put it. Um, we, we can't be so focused on one thing that we, lose, that we uh, end up getting smacked by a semi-truck as it's, as it's coming up the lane. Um, we, 
let's see, where was I going with that? I didn't even like my own analogy, so I, I kind of was admonishing myself, and then I lost track of... Uh, you know, uh, oh, that's what I was going to say. Uh, a lot of these codes came into existence for a reason, and most of those reasons are good reasons. Uh, and so that balance and that tension of trying to figure out what can we tweak um, and, and not have it uh, apply unintended consequences to the equation is going to be an interesting conversation. I think it's a valuable conversation. Um, I will tell you one thing. I, uh, there were several times during the presentation this evening that I saw um, clear candidates for common ground where we could probably clear th some things up and, and really cut through some red tape and, and uh, a, a lot of that stuff made sense to me. I think each of us are going to come at this with certain blinders and we just don't want to be chasing that ball out into the street. So I, I think we'll kind of cover each other's um, you know, blind angles there a little bit. And I have faith that our consultancy uh, is, is, has, has the, the overall objectives uh, for the, you know, all of the goals we're trying to balance in mind. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Harris. So I am gonna tell a story. <clears throat> uh, when I bought my first house, uh, I had just enough money for the down payment to get in. If it was a little bit higher, or if there was any other um, thing that I had to pay, I would not have been able to get in that house. I would have probably had to wait a couple more years. So all I'm saying is that when we're looking at all of this stuff, we have to make sure that we are not keeping people out of homes. Um, Every time we add something to a home, that cost gets passed on to the uh, person who's buying it because the developer isn't going to eat that cost. And so that's the thing that we have to be careful about is that what are we requiring and to make sure that it's not keeping people out of homes. Also, the, the other thing is that everybody doesn't want to own a home. A lot of people want to just rent. And so are we keeping people out of apartments because we're demanding that developers do things that those people can't afford anyway? So if we're requiring you to put uh, charging stations in apartments and the people who are living in low-income apartments can't afford an electric car, why are we doing that? So we have to be smart about what we're requiring and what our codes are, are doing. Um, and then in terms of community outreach, there are organizations in this community who have been working in neighborhoods for years. And I would encourage you to reach out to those organizations because sometimes the people that you hire as consultants, they come to those organizations to do the work. So that just might be something you wanna consider. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you, council member. Uh, I am so excited to, to even see this um, much of what you've been working on, and I think that you're on the right track, and I'm really happy about what I'm seeing. I was just reading an article from the Rocky Mountain Institute about housing, so my, uh, my ears perked up when you're talking about how do we um, make it more um, uh, palatable for developers to build modestly priced housing, modestly sized housing. Um, I think that that's one of the key things that I'm going to be looking for is um, how do we just make that um, easier so that maybe it's more of a default because we definitely need that missing middle um, housing in Flagstaff and I know that a lot of us are concerned that if we don't really address these codes and address the way that we use our um, valuable land resources that we 
that all future development is going to be large houses on large lots and be out of the reach for people who are living and are invested in this community. So um, that's music to my ears to, to hear you talk about that. Councilmember Sweet. Thank you, Mayor. I was in a meeting with um, a resident and she asked, why are we not being able to build moderate sized homes? and I will point her to this presentation. I wanted to thank you for doing your due diligence, and I know you wanted to get this to us before break, but I think it's an important conversation, and um, I think you, you definitely are on the right track, so thank you. Anything, Councilmember McCarthy. Well, I made some specific uh, comments before. I just would like to say that I really excited by this process. I see a lot of good coming out of this. And uh, when I read the packet, I, I literally got excited. It's great. Thank you. And not a lot gets Councilmember McCarthy, like, giddy. <laughs> um, uh, City Manager has a comment. Thanks. Um, I didn't want to interrupt the flow of conversation at the dais, but if Council's finished or wrapping up. Uh, I just wanted to start with um, thanking the consultants and the staff, a lot of team here that has been working on this staff level, the consultants I had the pleasure of meeting early on in this process virtually, and it seems like a long time ago, it's obvious that a lot of work has uh, been performed since then. So thank you so much, it was a great presentation. Um, I typically don't weigh in on these policy discussions, but I, I want to uh, make mention of one thing. I was excited about all, all of it, uh, but on the resource protection, something uh, that truly resonates and I think is a very relevant and timely topic these days, and, and that is the health of our forests. Um, it just seems that our current standards in the RPO uh, do not adequately take into account forest health. Uh, and specifically the thinning of, of trees in areas that are very dense. Um, that could certainly be talked about in the context of fire risk, and it should be. But more uh, recently, also, um, we're hearing about it with respect to insurance, uh, homeowners insurance. And so as we think about things like fire um, risk, forest health, cost of insurance, I think all of these things really do lay the foundation for a revisiting of that particular policy. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I think another thought popped into my head is that I'm so glad that we're focusing on um, looking at our priorities of housing and sustainability and, and um, climate action and recognizing how the goals for each are so often um, in concert with each other. So th that's, that's going to be an important um, way to draw the public into the conversation because so many people have one or the other of those priorities. A lot of us have both. Um, so seeing it discussed in this context is um, gratifying to see. All right, I don't see any additional comments. Thank you so much, and thank you to the consultants. Thank you all. Thank you for your words of wisdom. Bye. All right, moving down to item number 11, future agenda item requests. So this is a request by Councilmember Matthews to place on a future agenda a discussion regarding the process for selecting the vice mayor. Um, so I'm going to to ask Councilmember Matthews to, um, you know, spend a couple of minutes telling us about um, why she's made this request, and then we need three council members, so two additional council members, um, in addition to Councilmember Matthews, to um, to request that this move forward for a more in-depth discussion. So, Councilmember Matthews, thank you, Mayor. Yes. Um, you know, when I was running for council, I think we all have aspirations to be the vice mayor, you know, to reach that goal. 
Um, and, um, you know, once I was elected, the common um, statement to me was, are you still drinking from the fire hose? And we most certainly are at this first part of the first year. It's just we think we know, observing from, you know, the audience or online and stuff. But, um, you know, it's important, I think, to have um, some history and um, some experience and expertise in the things that we do up here. And I'm so glad that it was uh, the vice mayor who became vice mayor <laughs> um, because he seasoned, you know, in that role. Um, so, and I talked to council member uh, McCarthy about it. And he said it wasn't not too long ago that it was um, the person who got the most votes two years prior which then covered that, giving you that experience in seasonality to what it takes to be a good, good represent, representative of our community because it's not just a, a you know, a, a, an accomplishment, a pride thing. It's, it's about serving our community and, and having the experience and the knowledge that goes along with it. Um, so I would just like, I don't know what the solution is. You, you know, you take from one and then it, you know, maybe takes away an opportunity from another side of it, but I'd like to have it on the agenda um, before we even, I don't think we have to go to primaries now, I didn't know that at the time, but um, just so we can really put some thought into how we want to um, make any changes if if that's what comes out of it, just to, just to give us more preparation to be good representation um, for our city and have someone that has the experience behind them um, because that is a big role, uh, the vice mayor, to to fill in uh, for the mayor. And, and um, I think that it is someone that needs, you know, a little bit of time and not drink from the fire hose and take on that responsibility. So... I'd like to put it on the agenda just to have a more robust conversation about the pros and cons and see where it goes from there. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member McCarthy. One, one, Mayor, it's just really whether or not there are two to support moving it forward. The discussion isn't tonight. Thanks. So I, but I see that Council Member McCarthy has some comments that he would like to make that he's prepared. I will, I will say that this will be very short. All right, so before council adopted the current method of selecting the vice mayor, the procedure was to appoint the person who had received the most votes in the prior election, that is, in the election two years before. I am in favor of such a procedure because it is, a rash, it is rational and does not pit council members against each other in a popularity contest. Okay, here's the part Sterling's looking for. With that in mind, I support moving this fair forward. Uh, and then briefly, I'll note that I do have a lot of more thoughts about this. I've been thinking about this for like five years. And I'll save those thoughts for the discussion, assuming this comes back. Whew, that wasn't too bad, Sterling. All right, so we need one more council member to support moving this forward. Just need a thumbs up. All right, so we will get it on a future um, agenda. Thank you, Councilmember Matthews. Uh, Sorry, Mayor, who oh. was the other thumbs up? Oh, Deb, okay. <laughs> All right, so moving down to open call to the public. Kevin Crittenden, or Crichtonton. Okay, we think Kevin left. Um, Stephen Anthony Young. Okay, uh, he left as well, and I don't see any online comment. I am correct, correct? All right, uh, so we will move down to informational items to from mayor, council, and staff, and future agenda item requests. Uh, let's start with Councilmember House. Thank you, Mayor. Just a couple items from me. 
Um, this past weekend was the Northern Arizona Book Festival, and it was absolutely amazing to get to participate in some of those events. Um, didn't get out to as many as I hoped to, but um, even some that were online were just absolutely amazing to see the literary culture that exists within this community and, and have an opportunity to celebrate that. Um, I just wanted to give the reminder that um, of a couple other commemorations and celebrations that are happening this month. Um, this past week, ending tomorrow, was uh, Black Maternal Health Week. Um, April is also Autism Acceptance Month um, and uh, Minority Health Month. And I just think it's really important for us to take opportunities to highlight and bring awareness to those uh, those topics and uh, the communities that are impacted by them uh, and not forget to uh, show that recognition. And then finally, I had the opportunity this afternoon to join the mayor at a um, listening session with the Arizona Office of Tourism. It was one of the most inspirational uh, meetings that I've had in a while, again, um, just a really great opportunity to brag on Flagstaff hear their vision for um, really branding and telling the story of the state overall, and just having an opportunity to talk and, and think reflectively um, in a group on the, uh, for lack of a better word, because I can't think of a better one than what came out of the, the meeting today, the magic of a community like Flagstaff, where so many things become possible just because we are a community of dreamers uh, and a community of innovators. So um, definitely I'm looking forward to seeing some of the outcomes from that listening session and seeing how we can reinforce that vision of Flagstaff for the rest of our community as well. Thank you. Councilmember Sweet. I can't top that, nothing for me. <laughs> Councilmember McCarthy. Nothing tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I don't think there's any better time to do this. Uh, so I would like to just kind of rip the Band-Aid off, as it were. I would like to ask that we expedite the fair item that was brought to us by the community several weeks ago and that was forwarded, uh, the petition around the ceasefire. <laughs> And we need three council members, three additional council members to support this, correct? Right, without any back and forth, that can come <laughs> forward at any time, but we would need four total, so there's one with the vice mayor. Two, uh, three, and I'll go four. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that's all I have tonight. Did we get it? Or no? We got it. Oh, great. Uh, council member Harris. Okay, a couple of things. Um, this week, I was, I was able to attend the Congress to Campus uh, event at the university, and I didn't even know they did this, but they send retired Congress people uh, to universities uh, and colleges all over the country uh, for them to have these open town halls. And so Tom Petrie, uh, who is a Republican, and Karen English, who is a Democrat from um, Flagstaff, were both uh, at the town hall, and the students really enjoyed having an opportunity to talk with them and ask them lots of questions, and so that was a good thing. I misspoke earlier when I said um, Ponderosa Park, I meant uh, Bushmaster Park with all the stuff that's going in. Um, and then the Affordable Housing Summit um, at Southside uh, Community Association along with the Institute on uh, Leadership at from Northern Arizona University will be putting on the Affordable Housing Summit. And then the last thing is Miss Cleo's Tea Party is the 29th and tickets are still available. <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Matthews. Thank you. I too went to the listening uh, event, I guess the earlier one with the Office of Tourism. Um, didn't see you guys there, so you must have been that crowd coming in afterwards, but it was very informative and it was great to hear everyone's words and insight on what they see about Flagstaff and what we think we need to do better. So it was a great uh, community event. I have nothing, 
City Manager, do you have any? City Manager? No, thank you, Mayor. Council Member? Well, when Council Member uh, Harris mentioned Congressman, I remember that Sunday I was in this room and there were two former congressmen, uh, uh, Karen English and uh, um, Tom O'Halloran. Oh, was it Ann Kirkpatrick? I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not thinking. And uh, the mayor and uh, Ms. Sweet were there also. Anyway, it was a memorial service for our former uh, mayor, uh, Paul Babbitt which was a, a very touching ceremony. It, it filled this room, that room, and the lobby. I'll leave it at that. And I guess I do have something to say. Just want to thank um, Mr. Paul Babbitt Jr. for his um, role in making City Hall uh, reality. So with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>